podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Network on Sunday, September 12th, 2021. This is episode 1828. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash twit1 and use the code twit1 for $100 off select mattresses. And by AT&T. If there are friends and family members you haven't talked to in a while, don't worry, it's never too late to reconnect. To help, AT&T is offering deals on the latest smartphones. It's not complicated. Everyone deserves something new. So AT&T is giving new and existing customers their best deals on every smartphone, even the latest ones. Restrictions and exceptions may apply. Visit att.com for details. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Good to see you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, it's that time again. Time to talk computers and the Internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smartwatches and all that jazz. My phone number, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion, 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside that area, you can still reach me, but you have to uh, probably use Skype or something like that to call. Anything they could call a phone number. Uh, and it should be free. 8888-ASK-LEO. Website, techguylabs.com. I mentioned that so you don't feel like, uh, oh, I heard something, I got to write that down. I don't want to forget it or I want to keep track of it or whatever. I want to, even better, I want to give uh, Leo a correction or an update or here's a better idea. You can do that all at the website because it's free and it's open to all. Techguylabs.com. That's all you have to remember. Phone number's there. Links to the chat room are there. Everything. Techguylabs.com. Calm. Ah, day after tomorrow, as the crow flies, Apple will uh, do an event. iPhone 13, yeah, probably. Four models uh, have already been kind of revealed at the FCC. So what would that be? A 13, a 13 Pro, a 13 Pro Max, and a 13 Mini. That's my guess. We should also hear about new AirPod Pros, the third version of those, AirPods. Uh, this time with silicone tips. Wow. Uh, maybe a new Apple Watch, too. There's a pretty like good likelihood of an Apple Watch Series 7. That may be hard to get at first because of uh, chip shortages. There you have it. There's a weird rumor going around that maybe tomorrow, the day before, uh, Google will announce its Pixel 6. That would be weird. That would be cray-cray. Xiaomi is announcing a new phone tomorrow. We know that for sure. But that's not a big deal so much because uh, those are really those phones are pretty much big in China. And uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, look, the iPhone, it's, it is known, sucks all the air out of the room when Apple announces an iPhone. That's all anybody could talk about for a while. So I won't talk about it anymore because you'll be hearing enough of it. Uh, I will answer one question, which I get a lot, which is, do you think Apple announced new laptops because I'm waiting to get a new laptop at school time or whatever? I need a new laptop. Probably not. That's probably for uh, October, be my guess. So there there you have it. That's it. That's all we're going to say. We don't <laughs> need, need say no more. Say no more. Say no more. That's uh, that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be... They did lose a... Well, lose or win. Apple's, Apple's acting like they won... Epic's acting like they lost, but I don't know. I think Apple might uh, might be just kind of, uh, you know, wa ru rubbing it and walking it off, not not admitting the wound. On Friday, and this this is in the in the lawsuit between Epic, the creators of the Fortnite game, and Apple. Epic really set this up when they decided to offer digital goods in the Fortnite game on iPhones and iPads uh, through the Epic Store, not through the Apple Store. Apple said, you can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. Epic said, watch us. Apple said, watch this, and not kicked them out of the store. And, and Epic said, we were ready for that, and sued. 
That's the story so far. <laughs> Uh, Epic said Apple uh, is is acting like a monopoly, and uh, but you know I mean they're not a monopoly. But if if you're using an iPhone, they're a monopoly. It's the only place you can get apps for the iPhone is in the App Store, right? You can get web apps, but Apple's kind of lukewarm in its support for web apps, even though that's how the iPhone started. And they they want you to buy stuff in the store. Their argument is that makes it safer, more secure, more reliable. That's the argument they presented to the court. Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers, who is pretty smart, she's a U.S. District Court uh, judge, pretty smart, um, said, no, yeah, you're right, Apple's not a monopoly. Apple, you win that one. Epic said, oh. And they said, and Epic, uh, you have to pay your court costs. Apple, you have to pay your court costs. That's a split. But here's the interesting ruling an injunction saying Apple could no longer block third-party applications from putting pointers in their apps to outside the app store. A little chink in Apple's armor. Epic could, for instance, put a button or a link in Fortnite that says, to buy cool new costumes for your player, Click this link and it'll go to the Epic Store on the web. You buy it there and it'll appear in your game. Apple has prevented that. Apple's, Apple has up to now said you can't even mention that. If you're Amazon in the Kindle app, you can't even mention that. Oh, by the way, if you want to buy books, you got to go to the app. You got to go to the web, rather. You got to go buy this from Amazon.com. You can't buy them in the Kindle app. Uh, they've said to Netflix, you can't, you know, tell people to go subscribe to Netflix. On the web, you can you, that not not allowed. Apple says you have to just let them buy it on uh, the app, and we get thirty. Oh, and this is the whole point: we get thirty percent of that. Well, the judge said nope, can't stop them. Uh, they did not. The judge did not say th you have to put other people's app stores on there. Uh, you don't have to. Ch yeah, they didn't change the fees. It's still thirty percent. The judge said you are not a monopoly. Don't worry about that. The ruling says Apple must let developers communicate with customers, quote, and this is where it's all going to come down to, this sentence, through points of contact obtained voluntarily from customers through registration within the app. So suddenly, uh, and Apple's prevented this, uh, the app will have your email address, which you gave them. Apple said, no, no, only we can have that. And... You have to, you cannot prevent apps from having links out to other payment platforms. Now, this is going to be, Apple said, well, we don't know what that means. We're going to have to sit down with a judge and find out. iOS apps can use, quote, buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing methods other than Apple's payment system. Ooh, that's going to be interesting. Could cost Apple billions of dollars in lost fees. Apple has always said, look, we made this beautiful thing, the phone, and we made this beautiful store for developers, and all we ask is 30%. And by the way, I, I, I should point out, that's what Microsoft charges apps in the Xbox store. That's what Sony charges apps in the PlayStation store. It's kind of the going rate. And in the old days when software, you know, you'd put it in a box with floppy disks, and you'd put it on a store shelf. If you buy software at Staples or Office Depot... Chances are they're taking at least half of the revenue, more than thirty percent. So thirty percent, Apple says, well, that's uh, not that's not unheard of. It's not it's a the going rate, and it's fair for what you get. And the judge has not said that's not the case. She didn't say, oh no, you you can't take that cut. She also didn't force Apple to let Fortnite back in. Fortnite is still not going to be on the App Store. This will be interesting. I think this might be the beginning of something. South Korea, by law, says Apple in South Korea has to offer other in-app payments or allow others to do so. Eh, I just mentioned that because, uh, you know, you know Apple won't say anything about it on Tuesday. <laughs> that will not be a topic of conversation on Tuesday. Um. Microsoft said on Thursday it's going to indefinitely delay <clears throat> the reopening of its headquarters in Redmond, Washington. Google's done the same. A lot of companies have. So 
We all thought it'd be back to normal by now. Nope. And you know, I think these companies are learning. It's not, not the end of the world to let employees work from home, especially, you know, a certain kind of employee can work from home pretty well. Not you, Professor Laura. You have to come in and press that button. on the. Somebody's got to sit there pressing the buttons. Our engineers have to come in. But, they're, but you know, knowledge workers who are maybe programmers, coders, that kind, kind of people, they can work at home. I have seen studies that say they don't do as good a job, but uh, I've seen studies in the opposite, too. And certainly workers really like it. Workers say, I like it. Or some don't, though, right? Do you want to, are, you, are you excited about coming back to the office? We had all of our staff come back to the only oh, little company. It's a podcast network, so there's only about 20 people. We had them come back, and then we sent them home again. But we're giving them the option. We're saying, if you want to come in in your office, you're the only one in your office. You have to wear a mask when you're in prom-prem. Uh, but if you want to work here, you can. And so we're giving them the option. And I think a few people are coming in. Most people, I think, are welcoming the chance to stay home. What do you think? Do you like working from home? We get, at first it was like, oh, my God, oh, this is not going to be terrible. But now we kind of got used to it. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. We can talk high tech. There's lots more to talk about. I'm really curious to see if Google announces a phone tomorrow. That would show chutzpah. Chutzpah. <laughs> yeah, that was those Apple guys. Who cares? We got a phone. And Google's new phone, by the way, has some interesting features you might have seen the ad they're advertising all over the nfl games this week you'll see it if you haven't yet it's got uh, artificial intelligence uh, built into it it's an interesting uh, interesting uh, idea she is our black telephone woman <laughs> i don't know you're not a you're not a black magic woman oh we started watching the scariest show on netflix oh with a black magic woman with a witch in it uh, okay. It's called uh, something like Brand New Cherry Flavor or something like that. <laughs> it's weird. Not something I'd ever click on. It's Well, you know what? You, that's a good point. Brand New Cherry Flavor. Is, that's a good point. I don't know why I clicked on it. Unless uh, it's my chapstick or a candy. Probably. I was getting desperate. And by the way, I'm eight, seven episodes in and I still don't know why they called it Brand New Cherry Flavor. But To get your attention? It did. <laughs> it's 90s L.A. Horror Noir. How about that? Okay. It's very weird. I'm not recommending it. I just <laughs> but I'd you're mention. seven episodes in? Well, <laughs> never watch a show hoping it's going to get better. Not seven episodes. <laughs> no, it's actually pre it's actually pretty good. I like it. Maybe two. <laughs> you know, uh, my wife, Lisa, uh, we, we said, let's go to dinner early, come home and binge something. Okay. I said, okay. And we did. <laughs> and now I've got a binge over. It's like a hangover. Oh. But, but, but not, there was no alcohol no, no, involved. No, no headache? <laughs> no fun involved. Oh, okay. Just a lot of, uh, just my TV watching. Hey, who should I uh, start with first? I think that you you should help Jen spend a little bit of money. Yeah, in Tri-City, Washington. Love doing but that. But is it going to be a little money or a lot of money? That's the question. Well, that's up to Jen. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's the one with the checkbook. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Hello, Jen. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Hey. Yes, I do. I'm just trying to figure out, being uh, we're retired and budget conscious, but we're still willing to spend the money. And I just kind of want to have you talk me through the two phones that we're looking at through our carrier. Okay. And one is the XR, iPhone XR, and it's 350 Yep. Came in 2018, it looks like. And yep. then the other one we're looking at is the iPhone 11, and that is at 600 Oh, that's a lot more. Holy cow. Yeah. You yeah. might wait until after Tuesday. When they announce a new phone, Apple will also announce price cuts for older phones. So you might get a better... I wouldn't buy one today. I'd wait if you can wait till Wednesday. <laughs> um, okay. Apple events always uh, uh, reduce the phones. Apple has a very tight control of how much the phones <laughs> cost. So it's up to them to reduce the prices. And uh, I suspect uh, they will. The 10R, the XR, as you call it, is a good phone. That's a very good phone. How, what which what I, I I presume you're using an iPhone now? Yes, and we're using a six, and had no idea that um, we needed to be keeping an eye on the update levels. And somebody yeah. mentioned their their updates were at fourteen, and ours only goes to a couple below that. And yeah, so that's what triggered me. I better be getting something new. But then um, on the XR, I just wondered if 
how many years am I going to get for updates? That's already a few years old. And That's a good point. Yeah. 11 is one year older, newer only. Okay, so last week when I looked at the 11, it was seven and a half, and it had dropped down today to 600, I noticed. And the problem is the 12s, not that I really want to spend that much, but the 12s were all out of stock. So I'm concerned about... They're also the really stock. expensive, and I, you know, I understand you don't want to spend that much money. Um, so the iPhone XR will be supported until 2023, so only two more years. Okay. So Apple typically gives a phone five years. Your iPhone 6 is like seven years old. It's pretty old, right? Yeah. So the yeah. 10R was the first of the new generations of the iPhones. The 10, when the iPhone 10 came out on the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, uh, that was the new generation. You get six year, five years of iOS support. So you'll get to be iOS 15 when that comes out this week, 16, uh, probably even 17. And then you get security updates for another year after that. And that's really the most important thing. Uh, okay. Because the, the big feature updates, yeah, maybe that's cool, but it's security that we care most about. So right. I don't. I think the 10R, you'll probably get it through security updates through 2024. How's that feel? That's three more years. That's not too bad for the price. So. Yeah, and that's why it's 300 bucks. <laughs> right. And as I said, it'll probably go down even more. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think the 10R is a really good choice. I used that one for a long time. I think that's a very nice phone. And I hate for you to spend twice as much on the 11. That's, you know, that's the next year. That's kind of crazy. So, yeah, go, yeah. For, go for the 10R. I think you guys will be very – you're going to buy two of them? Yeah. 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 I would just wait and see what happens on Tuesday. Because they're gonna, everything kind of clicks forward one year uh, in right. September, and so the prices will go down, and the, you know, because the new phone's now going to be the 13, so the prices will go down. In fact, the 11 might go down to 400. I wouldn't be surprised to see it at 400 bucks, and then it might be like, oh, well, for 100 bucks more, we get a few years more. That might be worth it. Yeah. It, feature wise, I don't think you're going to see much difference. The 10R has an excellent camera. Uh, it's a really nice phone. That was the first uh, phone, I think, that had uh, the inexpensive one that had OLED screens. I think it has OLED. I can't remember if it does or not. But that, I remember how much I liked the 10R. Great. Right. Okay. So go for it, man. Don't be, uh, you know, it's really a shame that these phones cost so much money. But I think Apple's, <laughs> Apple's attitude is... Uh, we want to make the best phone we can make and our fans will pay the money and then we'll offer older phones for less money. The other one you should look at and watch carefully what Apple announces on Tuesday. The SE is very popular. I don't know if you price the iPhone SE. When they release that, it's current. It has the latest processor or maybe a year old processor and so will last a little bit longer. So don't get current SE, but see if they announce one Tuesday. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, let me just see what they're charging for the SE. Yeah, SE. Right now the SE is three ninety nine, so it's more. It's it's a hundred bucks more. But that has a, a more recent processor in it. So. Oh. Yeah. Alrighty. So that's it and it's really small. People love the SE. I love the SE. It's a it's got an A thirteen. There, that's only a year old uh, processor. So. Well, it'll be two years old next next Tuesday. <laughs> I don't see there are companies offering that phone, however. Oh, I'm that's interesting. You can always get it from Apple, by the way. That's the other thing. You don't have to get it from your phone company unless they offer you something extra. And would you just go into Apple.com then? Yeah, and you just, which, who's your phone company? It's Consumer Cellular. Okay. Um, that's actually, I don't, you know, Apple will offer the big three phone companies. So you can, you can buy a new iPhone for AT&T, T-Mobile and uh, Verizon, but I don't know if they do it for consumer cellular. So you might have to go to consumer cellular to get it. Yeah. If you get an unlocked one in theory, you should ask consumer cellular. If I get an unlocked one, can I put my SIM in it and, and use it? And, and almost certainly they'll say yes. So. I, I seem to remember from past that they sell them locked for a certain amount of time. They do. So, That's right. But Apple doesn't. And oh. if it's unlocked, that means you could still use it. I get you. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. The other thing uh, to look at is Apple has a refurbished shop. If you Google Apple refurbished, you might get 
uh, a better deal. Refurbished just means they can't, somebody bought it and after a week, maybe they didn't even use it at all. They had regrets. They brought it back. Apple can't sell it as new, but it's as good as new and it's fully warranted. So that's another way to save money on an iPhone. Uh, I wondered about them. Okay, yeah. how about that? Yeah, but oh, Consumer okay. Cellular won't sell those. Apple will. So, there, yeah, okay. and also you get better support for the hardware for, if you buy it from Apple. Okay. So I don't. I I would ask Consumer Cellular, can I buy this from Apple instead? Because I want to get the SE and you don't offer it. And see what they say. They may say, no, you have to buy it from us because we want the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's a pleasure talking to you, Jen. I think you're going to be fine. These 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 are great phones. All righty. Yeah. I, I appreciate all the advice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. Okay. It is time to talk to our man in the driver's seat, Mr. Car Guy Sam Abul Samad, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's also the uh, podcaster that is the great Wheel Bearings podcaster at wheelbearings.media. And uh, your, your uh, co-host, Robbie... Roberto Baldwin was in Munich last week. He was. was yeah, it? he spent the past week in Munich for the IAA Mobility Show, and oh. while he was there, he was he was hosted by uh, by BMW, um, and uh, so they also did got to do first drives of the new BMW iX and the i4, BMW's two new electric vehicles. Um, I think. I think those drive impressions are still under embargo. I'm not sure when the embargo lifts, but uh, we'll definitely be talking about that on wheel bearings uh, as soon as that does, uh, as soon as that embargo does lift. Right, is there a time of year where there there are all the you know because isn't don't the new cars come out right about now or next couple of months? And that that used to be the case, uh, you know, back in the up until about well, probably the. Until the I internet, guess the late eighties. <laughs> but um, you know, since then, you know, since the nineties, you know, we've seen the the schedules basically kind of spread out all over, you know, throughout the year. And so vehicles now launch when they're ready. Um, ah. So there's no there's no specific time anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, it used to be a long time ago that uh, you know, beginning of September, you know, Labor Day weekend, car dealers would put up um, paper over their the windows of their their right. showrooms. You right. know, load in all the new cars and then take it all down and so exciting. Here's all the new the new model year you know vehicles and now it's just you know whenever it's ready is when they launch it. Um, so but that makes it more interesting you know, for some, us because there's always something new to talk about. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You're not you don't just have one week of news a year. <laughs> right, right. So uh, it it definitely yeah, means we do have more to cover. Uh, but speaking of the IA Mobility Show, one of the the things that was announced there this week, uh, Mobileye, uh, Intel Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger did a keynote there, uh, and part of that keynote he had uh, Mobileye's CEO uh, Amnon Shashua uh, come on. Uh, Mobileye is owned by Intel. They bought it in 2017 for 15 billion dollars. And Mobileye, um, they've been uh, uh, one of the leaders in machine vision systems for driver assist. So most of the lane keeping systems, lane keeping assist that you have in, in most cars around the world today are powered by Mobileye's uh, chips and software. Uh, and over the last several years, Mobileye's also been working on automated driving systems, fully autonomous vehicles. And they, uh, at the, the show, they announced that in 2022, they're planning to launch their first commercial pilots of uh, robo-taxi services in Munich uh, and in Tel Aviv, where Mobileye is based. Um, and the, the, the program in Munich is going to be in partnership with a company called Sixt, uh, who if you've, if you've ever traveled in Europe, you're probably familiar yes. with them. Yes. They're a European rental car company, and uh, they also do uh, ride-hailing services, things like that. So they're going to be working with Sixt in, in Germany, and uh, they have and said who, if any, partners they're going to have in uh, in Israel. But one of the interesting things about this is, you know, up until now, Mobileye's primarily been using the Ford Fusion Hybrid as their development platform vehicle for their for their system. Um, it's it's commonly used. You know, it's it's usually either Toyota or uh, Ford hybrid vehicles that are used because they have plenty of electrical power available from the hybrid system. They're uh, readily available, so everybody knows how to work on them, so they, they often use those. But for production, they're using a different vehicle uh, known as the NEO ES8. NEO is a Chinese uh, EV startup that launched uh, several years ago. Uh, the ES8 is a three-row crossover, roughly the size of um, a Hyundai Palisade, Ford Explorer, you know, in that, in that size class. 
Um, and one of the interesting things about NEO is they are building all of their vehicles to support battery swapping. Um, so you can do fast charging and slow charging on them, but you can. they have also built out a network in China of battery swap stations that are fully automated. Now, you might remember back in 2014, Tesla showed off uh, battery swapping and made a made big deal about, you know, they're going to support battery swapping in their cars. And, and they did it in the Model S and the, the Model X. Uh, but they only ever built one battery swap station, which was somewhere in the middle of the Central Valley of California, which is not particularly convenient uh, for anybody. And they've, they've never acknowledged this, but um, my friend... Um, Ed Niedermeyer, who wrote a book about Tesla uh, a couple of years ago, I think you, I think you did an interview yeah, with yeah. him on Triangulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that, that from his uh, research that came out of it, basically, it seems like the only reason they did that, that you know, they built the one battery swap station, is you know, so because there was a quirk in the rules in California that if your vehicle supported swapping, you got extra uh, EV credits that you <laughs> could sell. Yeah, and that's so, it. That's all. Huh? They never but, really intended but, to make it available. Right. But for NEO, they actually have made this available. I think they currently have about, uh, what is it, about 200 swap stations around China. Oh, interesting. Um, and they're building out a whole lot more. Um, you know, it's debatable. It's an instant fill up, right? How long does it take to swap the battery? It takes about three minutes to swap oh, the so battery. So it's better than going to a the, gas station. You know, yeah, so if you're watching the video stream, you can see it over my shoulder, yeah. you know, you know, the demo of it. Um, the swap station is about the size of three parking spaces, um, and it's all fully automated. You know, so you you pull into it, and it drops the battery the mechanism. You know, comes in, drops the unscrews the battery, it drops down, moves it over, pulls in a freshly charged battery, puts it back up, and wow. uh, bolts it back in. But then and, you have somebody else's battery in your car. I mean, we think of the battery as being part of the that's, vehicle these that, days. Yeah, that's that's one of the challenges. There's a lot of other, you know, economic challenges with battery swapping, um, especially because, you know, every manufacturer's got different battery formats, right. different sizes, and, um, you know, whether it makes sense for one automaker to ha build out their own network of swap stations, uh, you know, the, like I said, the economics are questionable. It almost makes Where more sense actually, for a fleet than it does for individual owners. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's what I was just going to get to. Yeah. You know, commercial vehicles, robo taxis, makes perfect sense for them because sure. with a with a fleet, you've got all the same kind of vehicle. Typically, you can locate some battery swap stations around the city, you know, and and most of the time, those vehicles are operating, uh, you know, usually in a geographically limited area. So you can put in those swap stations. They're not very big, and you can then, um, you know, when it's time to to swap. Uh, when, or when you need a charge, especially with something like a robo taxi, you know, where um, you want to have maximum uptime, you don't want it sitting around for several hours a day charging. Uh, you want to, you know, you want to be able to get in and out, get back on the road, and maximize the utilization of that vehicle. Battery swapping actually makes perfect sense for that kind of vehicle. So I think it's, I think that's a big reason why Mobileye chose to go with Neo. Uh, because I think what they're going to do, they haven't officially announced that yet, but I think they're, we're probably going to see them put in um, a network of swap stations around Munich and around Tel Aviv uh, and use that you know, so that they can maximize the uptime for these vehicles, maximize the availability, yeah. um, because it, it just makes sense for that kind of use. <laughs> Meanwhile, Chevy can't even figure out how, when and how it's going to swap my battery in my Chevy Bolt. So, so we're parking it outside, far away from the house, and charging it outside, and hoping it doesn't burst into flame. Um, and it, so I think, that's I an example of how yet. hard it is to change a battery. They haven't figured out how to do yeah. it yet. Yeah. Well, it's it's not so much that it's a problem of of knowing how to change the battery, but they actually have to get more batteries and right. verify and know that they're the safe. batteries are good. Yeah. I mean, once once they have the batteries, you know, they, you can take it to the dealer. They can they can swap it in a couple of hours. They haven't even That's sent us a, so a letter yet. We still don't. You know, I only know about it from you. Uh, oh well, you know, we'll we'll figure this one out. I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mr. So. Sam Abul Samad, his batteries never need to be changed. He's running. On <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Pure ATP. He is a principal <laughs> researcher at Kitehouse Insights. He's also got a great podcast if you haven't heard it. Uh, if you love vehicles and cars and automotive news, wheel bearings, look for it in your favorite uh, podcast client or go to wheelbearings.media. Sam, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. 
My pleasure. Go Leo. Niners. <laughs> Take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not gonna let you respond to that. <laughs> you're not I, a you're not, not a football lying. fan. You're not a big football fan. No, right? no, yeah. I'm surprised. You seem like you would be. I played football in high school. Oh yeah, you um, look like you might have. Yeah, yeah. When, yeah. when when I was when I was young, um, you know, I was more of a football fan. But you know, the the fascination waned. Yeah. You know, it's because of Lisa. She loves it so much. You should. I'm. I'm leaving the house. She's screaming at the top of her lungs. She's so <laughs> into it. It's so good. And I have to say they, that last year. I guess they must be playing here in Detroit then, right? Yeah, that's in Detroit. Yeah, it's 10, 8, 10 o'clock okay. game our time. Um, if playing is the word, I don't know. Well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I will give you the con if you want for the next three minutes. And, sure. Uh, you want to stick around for the top of the hour too? Uh, I can do that. I appreciate it. Enjoy. Have fun. All right. So um, one of the questions that came up in the chat last week that I didn't get a chance to respond to uh, was uh, about uh, 3G sunsetting for Volvo. Uh, somebody had asked about that. And this is this is going to be an issue with a lot of uh, vehicles. Um, you know, as you make the transition, uh, and this is actually not the first time it's happened, as you make the transition from one generation of communications technology to another, um, sometimes some of the vehicles are going to get obsoleted and they may lose their connectivity, um, and especially on older vehicles. So this first happened back in about 2007, 2008, with the first generation of GM vehicles that had OnStar. Um, on, the original version of OnStar uh, actually had uh, 1G, uh, analog uh, cellular connectivity. And around 2007 or 8, they were shutting off the analog networks and transitioning to 2G and 3G exclusively. And this was even before 4G came out. Uh, and so a whole bunch of GM vehicles built between 1996 and about 2005. It was around 2005 or six that they switched over to 2G in, for OnStar. But the, the older ones, at that point, they could no longer access the network because the, the analog networks were getting shut off. Same thing happened a few years later uh, when we went from 2G to 3G, around 2013 or so, I think. Um, some of the, the Nissan Leafs, um, the first generation of Nissan Leafs that had 2G connectivity, um, they lost that as the, the 2G networks were being shut down and repurposed for 3G and 4G. And um, at that time, Nissan uh, actually came up with uh, a retrofit kit to upgrade some of those vehicles. Um, so they went from a 2G to a 3G radio. We're seeing that again now as the carriers are starting to get ready to shut down the 3G networks. And uh, so uh, though uh, some of those vehicles, I'm not sure what the case is with Volvo. Some of the 3G equipped vehicles um, will be able to get upgrades to an LTE radio uh, or maybe uh, probably not a 5G radio yet, but maybe an LTE radio uh, and uh, others probably won't. So I'm, I'm not sure what the case is with Volvo, whether they'll be upgradable. But what we're seeing now is as connectivity is becoming standard pretty much across the board on all new vehicles is that we're, we're getting to a point where uh, uh, they're, they're starting to design the vehicles to be upgradable so that going forward, you will see, um, you know, as the four, eventually the 4G networks get shut down and transition to 5G and 6G or whatever in the future, they're going to, they're making them so that they can replace that radio and put in uh, a 4G or, or 5G or whatever, you know, later technology radio uh, so that they can stay connected to the to the networks. And I'm going to hand it back to Leo uh, right now, but Thank I'll you. be back at the next break. All right. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, this is a problem with phones, too. You know, this whole turning yep. off the 2G and 3G radios is a lot of people calling saying my phone's not going to work. Our Tech Guy Show brought to you today by my mattress, the one I slept on last night. Did you notice I'm kind of in a good mood? Lots of energy today. Oh, man, I love my Casper. Ah, oh, it's so good. There's, You know, if you have a great mattress and great bedding, it's just the best feeling. You know, come time to turn out the lights in the house, lock the place up, and get in bed, and you get in bed, and you just go, oh, right? feels so good. You will especially appreciate the new Casper Cooling Collection. 
technology to keep you sleeping cool. You know, nobody wants to wake up and sweating, right? Research shows sleeping cool is a better sleep. It starts with Casper's Wave Hybrid Snow Mattress, which keeps you cool for 12 plus hours, pulling heat away from your body for sustained temperature regulation. It's really better to call it temperature regulation. It's not just cool. It's like regulated, like it's good. It's the right temperature, a cool to the touch feeling and a much improved tomorrow. It's that great feeling, you know, when you turn your pillow over and it's nice and fresh and cool. In fact, you might as well get the Casper pillows. Better bedding makes for a better tomorrow, too. Casper now has hyperlight sheets that are designed with an innovative grid weave that lets air flow through for maximum breathability. They've got duvets, a lightweight duvet with optimal temperature control without giving up that plush comfort you love your duvet for. And don't forget the mattress protector. Casper's breathable mattress protector improves the coolness of the bed even further by allowing air to flow between your body and the mattress. It all works together to prevent overheating all night because cooler sleep means better sleep. And you know what? Better sleep means better tomorrows. When it, and as always, Casper offers free shipping and free returns. I don't know how many Caspers I've purchased and given to friends and family. And of course, we sleep on one. I just, I'm all in on Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, mattresses, sheets. I love my Casper pillow. Don't forget the pillows too. At casper.com slash twit1. Use that code twit1 for $100 off select mattresses. That's a twit and the number one. T-W-I-T-1 for $100 off select mattresses. Exclusions apply. See casper.com for more details. C-A-S-P-E-R casper.com slash twit and the number one. Twit1. Thank you, Casper, for supporting the tech guy and, I don't know, making me feel great this morning. <laughs> Casper. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hand me down my walking shoes. My, my cane. Dan on the line. I'm sorry, Don from Springfield, Illinois. Hello, Don. Hey, Leo. Before I get to my question, uh, you were talking about remote work. And I got to tell you, I think the entire world of office work has changed and it's never going back to the way it was. Are you happy about that? You think that's good? I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You know, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld, but I have to disagree with him. <laughs> I do think new, cities like New York are going to have serious problems in the future without the steady flow of suburban commuters. That's going to be so, interesting. I think uh, their, their role may change. But you're right. I think this whole idea of going to an office and working 9 to 5 is kind of an industrial era concept it's almost like you're on an assembly line and you have to show up to to screw in the widget and uh information workers these days can work anywhere so it is it's interesting to see how covid is changing our lives in so many ways and even after the pandemic if it ever ends i think things may may be a little different i have high hopes that the city will survive i would i would be sad if we lost our uh, urban uh, metropolises maybe they'll have another reason to be what can I do for you? So, uh, so my question is, I have about a two-year-old uh, uh, Dell laptop here, a Dell Latitude, and I heard about Windows 11 coming out next month, and I was wondering what's different in Windows 11, and <laughs> is it worth upgrading, and will I have problems if I do upgrade? <laughs> this is the question I ask all the time and really haven't got a great answer. Uh, you know, of course, Microsoft says, well, it's just better. It's better. Uh, under the hood, I think... It is essentially, for all intents and purposes, just Windows 10. That really, the changes in Windows 11 are mostly cosmetic. You should be able to upgrade with a two-year-old Lenovo. The requirements are an eighth generation or later Intel processor. I think you'll probably have that. Uh, and you have to have something called TPM 2.0. This is an Intel technology, trusted platform, uh, uh, trusted platform something, module. And uh, it's a security, a hardware security module. And actually, you can get them on AMDs, and it can be built into the motherboard, or it can be done in software. And uh, almost certainly, your Lenovo will have that. It may not be turned on. So will you be offered a free upgrade? Probably. As long as your hardware is compatible, yes. Uh, should you care? Probably not. 
You know, it may be at some point down the road, Microsoft says, well, we're not going to give Windows 10 security updates. But that's that's it. That's 2025. That's a, a bit of a way off. So There's no new features that'll be beneficial to me or. Well, if you like rounded corners, it'll be <laughs> it'll, it'll be great. Uh, if you if you like a centered start menu, uh, that's one of the new features, although you can turn that off if you want to have the traditional uh, left flush left start menu. There are going to be updated uh, versions of many of the Microsoft apps, but those will also come to Windows 10. The biggest thing that maybe will make a difference for you, and it's not going to happen when Windows 11 first comes out, but at some point, probably next year, Microsoft will start adding Android apps to the App Store. They're going to have a, a subsystem, like they have the Windows subsystem for Linux, they're going to have a Windows subsystem for Android that will let you, in emulation, run many Android apps. Honestly, I think that's a terrible idea. But if there's an Android app that you just have to have that you can't get on the web or in Windows, then I guess that would be good. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to watch Netflix, you'd be better off using your browser than an Android app, things like that. So that's a, maybe the one thing that's going to make a difference. I don't think it's a huge difference. Sounds good. Yeah, I don't care about the round of corners, but the no. Android thing might be interesting. So. Yeah, it might be. Honestly, I, I, and, I, and I talk to all the experts about this all the time. And I think the conclusion I've reached, and most of them have reached, is this is Microsoft doing this really for the PC makers. So that PC makers have something new to get you into the store this fall. Because otherwise, PC sales are going to drop dramatically. They did go up, remember, last year because of work from home. You know, everybody had to get a PC for their Zoom calls and the kids going to school and all that. But all of a sudden, you know, they've, they've everybody who needed one has got one. And now the sales have tumbled in the last quarter and they probably go down even more this quarter if there weren't something to bring people into the stores. And I think Microsoft's doing this for PC makers. Of course, they're a PC makers, so they do it for themselves, too, to get people back in the store. Sounds good. I really appreciate it, Leo. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's my that's my take on it. You're very welcome. It's nice to talk to you, Don. And, I, you know... I can't work from home. I mean, I technically could. You could. I can do a radio show or a podcast from anywhere. But uh, for me, I it's uh, if I if I if I tried when I first started doing this show back in uh, two thousand four. Uh, I did it from my house, um, and I found that my energy level was so poor because you just you know okay I'm gonna get out of bed. You don't have to put get dressed. You have to. You don't even have to shower. You just kind of sit down at the microphone. I just found it wasn't. It didn't feel like it's showtime. So uh, even back then, when I didn't have to, I rented a studio just so I'd have somewhere to go. It wasn't a radio studio. It was just an office, but I made it a studio. Now I'm in my own studio. Also, same thing. And it's just I like coming to work. Not for the people. There's no one here. <laughs> Kim's in another room. Our engineers are in another room. Professor Laura is in another city. <laughs> so it's not for the uh, social interaction. Um, I just I just need kind of to feel like I'm going to work. And I, can, I think there's people on both sides of this fence. That some people want to miss people. I think a lot of offices will start doing uh, retreats and maybe once a week company lunches where they encourage people to come in so that they can at least have some sort of social life. But it is an, it's kind of an industrial, you know, a, a, a Henry Ford idea that everybody has to come in, show up 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, because that's how work gets done. Yeah, well, it was when there was an assembly line, but it's not that way with information work. That's kind of one of the cool things about information work. There's downsides to it. Uh, you know, my, my kids who are in their 20s or millenn true millennials uh, are pretty much stuck with gig working. It's, you know, there hardly are 9 to 5 jobs anymore. You take a job here, a job there. My uh, nephews just got out of college, kind of the same thing. So uh, times, are, times are changing. And, of course, that's the old Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Joe, Knoxville, Tennessee. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Joe. Hello, Leo. Hello, Joe. Enjoying the nice cooler weather here in East Tennessee. Oh, I bet. It was hot for a while, wasn't it? Oof. Oh, yo, we had some, we hit record temperatures, <sighs> but it's, I think this morning it was in the 50s, and I don't think it's going to get, well, it's 83 right now. <laughs> looking for, I'm looking for whether I can get my trailer out and head to the mountains and, and do some camping. Sounds wonderful. Sounds like yeah. heaven. Yeah. Anyway, got a couple of questions. Uh, 
seems like over the last few months, when Windows does some updates, I start getting some unusual things starting starting to show up on my computer, and two, two of them, really two of them is, are the most annoying of all, and one of them just started up showing up recently. Uh, First one was the anytime you get your mouse down to the lower right corner of the screen, this Microsoft News stuff pops. Up. Oh, I hate that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Microsoft News is not news. It's the it's no. gossip and <laughs> junk. I just hate it. Yeah. So I'd like to know if there's some way to turn that off. And the second thing that started showing up in the last week or two, uh, all of a sudden, for some reason, in the upper left-hand corner, I start getting a volume control, <laughs> control box showing up. <laughs> oh, oh, Microsoft. I have tried it, oh, Microsoft. Said, oh, you know, click this, but don't, it does. If, if I turn, so turn let's this let's off, fix this. Off, let's fix the news one feet. first because that's really annoying. Annoying. Right-click on the taskbar and look at the check marks there, and you'll see news and interest, and you can hide it. So that's the first thing I do on every installation of Windows because I hate it. Uh, but we're going to have to take a break before I can give you the answer to the, uh, the other one. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually have to look that one up. I'm not sure. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Sorry, I had, had a... So that's how you turn off the news. Okay, um, I'm down in my taskbar and... Because uh, it's a, it's it's one of the you know in the lower right it's one of the okay I see news and interest yeah uncheck uh, that sucker off. yeah okay. <laughs> ah! yeah oh it's the first thing I do I hate that oh it's awful I don't care what Britney Spears is doing thank you very much I don't care anything about the news I mean <laughs> well, it's bad enough now our, our local news carries stuff from every place else but local yeah, I know isn't that and, terrible yeah uh, that's awful. All right, so there's news. Now, what's happening when you go to the upper left? You get a mouse. Well, no, if I it's not when I go on to, up to the upper left, it just all of a sudden I'll be you know I'll be viewing pages and all of a sudden I get a icon or a, a volume control box that shows up. Huh. It's a vertical box huh. and you can't move the position on the screen. And I run, normally that's uh, tied to a function key. Yeah, and I'm not hitting any keys. It'll just show up. And because I've let, you know, I've been, do, have done stuff on the computer, leave the room for a few minutes, come back, and here's this stupid box back. One thing I do know is I've got a, a sound bar that I use, uh, and it gets its feed through USB. And then I have some headphones that are plugged in through the high def, you know, the regular microphone headphone ports. Now, if it shows if it shows up when I'm in the microphone uh, headphone box uh, set up, if I click the the I've got a, a wireless keypad and mouse. If I click the mute button, it will not get rid of the box. If I go back to the soundbar selection in the uh, menu down at the bottom left hand when I click on the speaker, uh, then if I hit the mute button, it will cycle off. Hmm. So I'm thinking it's some some a driver or some software that came with the sound bar somehow related to that. I've had, I've had this sound bar for a year and a half. Yeah. And this is just started showing up in the last month. Yeah. And it's you know it's, and I've looked up some things. I did Google search and says you know. Does it only happen when you're in the browser, or is it? Do you see it another? Do you see it any time? If I leave the browser, it'll be still be on the screen. Okay, so it's not just the browser. I've, I've closed the browser, and it'll still be on the screen. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Um, chat room, anybody have some ideas? Volume bar stuck in the top left of the desktop. Let me see. The chat room has put a link to a Microsoft forum. And I've tried you know, hitting escape, because lots of times that'll dump unwanted things off the screen. That doesn't work. You can't reposition it. I mean, and it covers up a lot of stuff. If you bring up the uh, Windows screen where your programs and stuff are, you can't move it. But it'll mask up, you know, the upper third of the screen. I would look. Side. I would look in your um, in your uh, drivers in your device manager and look at your sound devices. 
probably there's a driver associated with that sound bar or something else that's not behaving. And so, because normally, normally this this only pops up when you hit, you know, it depends on your computer, F5 or F6 or F3. To yeah, I'm not hit. Like I said, I'm not hitting any buttons at all. Yeah. I think it's a I think it's a driver, and it's probably a bad driver since it hasn't happened all along, but just recently. Yeah. Um, I think it's a bad driver. So look in your, you know how to get device manager? Yeah, I'm in device manager. Yeah, look at all the sound things. And there's one by one, disable the ones, you know, that are especially the ones associated with the sound bar and see if that's, um, see if that helps. I bet you it's related to that sound bar, but it might be some other driver. And, and now the problem is if you can get a new driver that'll fix that, it's a bug. It should be, it should, it, sometimes it'll pop up, but it should disappear. <coughs> And I presume it disappears when you reboot and then it comes back. I got to run, Joe, because it's time for Sam to have a little little me time with the chat room. Go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry to use up some of your time there. I'm going to go get a cup no of coffee. No problem, Leo. All right. Um, so continuing the conversation on battery swapping, uh, it's been going on in the, in the chat room. Uh, one, you know, the the big challenge with battery swapping, you know, we it was mentioned that uh, you know we've got standardized connectors for charging, um, but the the problem with swapping is that the battery technology itself is still evolving rapidly. You know, uh, I mean, even you know, take the Chevy Bolt for example. You know, from 2017 to 2019, the first three model years of the Bolt, uh, they had one battery chemistry in there. 2020, they went to a revised battery chemistry that gave them more energy density and longer range within the same size battery. Uh, and those two batteries are not compatible with each other. So, you know, you can't, um, you don't, you're not going to just swap. I mean, they're physically compatible, but you're not going to just swap those in and out. So, you know, as long as the battery itself is still evolving pretty dramatically and every manufacturer has a different pack size, different pack format, it becomes really hard, you know, unless every manufacturer wants to set up their own network of swap stations, which gets really expensive really fast. It, it becomes a, a, a challenge to to do that from an economic standpoint. Um, you know that's why it, it makes more sense. You know for a fleet. You know where if if they've got several hundred vehicles, you know, or maybe even several thousand vehicles of the same type, you know they can set up a bunch of swap stations around town, like for a robo taxi fleet, uh, and they're all using the same batteries. The you know the, there's one company that owns that fleet. Uh, they know the provenance of those batteries. You're not you're not getting somebody else's battery that may be more degraded. Uh, you know, so it's it's more difficult. It's more challenging for consumers to do that. Um, and uh, you know the, the you know one of the other challenge uh, one of the physical challenges of battery swapping, of course, is the coolant. Most um, you know except for the the Nissan Leaf, pretty much all other EVs right now use liquid cooled batteries. To, to manage the thermals. And uh, so, you know, as part of that mechanism, when you pull the battery out, put it in, you've got to have some sort of quick connect system in there. That's got to be a really robust system so it doesn't leak. Um, you know, when you're taking it on and off all the time, that's that's really difficult to design well uh, and make sure it's going to last over the life of the vehicle. You don't want that failing. Uh and uh, yes, uh, James in, in the chat room says, you know, doesn't that suggest a solution more in the area of power regulation to accommodate various battery tech? That is part of it. And that's actually one of the things that GM is doing in their next generation Altium batteries is they've incorporated the, the battery management system at the module level uh, so that it actually can regulate the output of each individual module. And you know, when they're doing servicing of the batteries, um, they can replace individual modules um, and balance them out you know, at the module level so you get the same output from each module. Uh, and when they're going to – when they take them out at the end of life in the vehicle and use them for second life stationary applications, they can also balance them out. That's, that's one part of the solution. But overall, it's still – um, it's still a really uh, difficult problem from an economic standpoint. You know, having that inventory of batteries. Um, you know, if you have to accommodate a lot of different battery packs uh, and have enough inventory, you know, to you know, so anytime somebody comes in, you've got a battery that's the right size to fit their car. If not, if you don't have everybody using the same thing. The other thing too is 
for a modular system, you know, like most batteries today, those modules take up physical, the packaging takes up physical space inside the pack, which limits how many cells you can have in there. So manufacturers are moving towards cell to pack designs where uh, you get rid of the modules. So now you just have all the cells packed right in, much like what um, Apple did with the batteries and laptops a, a decade or so ago. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Leo and I'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks, my friend. All right. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches. Hey, John, John, look, I got new rubber bands on here. Look at that. See, I can hit the microphone. Nothing bad happens. <laughs> I know. We could talk uh, how to put rubber bands on your microphone so that uh, you can bonk it. See, nothing happens. For about the last three months... <laughs> I've been <laughs> my microphone. So <laughs> I guess that's probably a little inside baseball. We'll talk about anything with a chip in it and mic microphone rubber bands. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. 888 827 5536. Never did come up with a good solution for our last caller. Ran out of time at the top of the hour. I definitely knew how to turn off the uh, news and interests feature <laughs> on Windows 10. And by the way, Microsoft is not only keeping it, they're renaming Microsoft News. <laughs> they are just in love with this Microsoft News product. I don't know why. I think they hired a bunch of people. So it was MSN News. Then it became Microsoft News. Uh, and it will now be called Microsoft Start. What? <laughs> what does that even mean? They say, because you're going to be starting your day with it. No, I'm not, because it's all gossip. It's all, it's not, it's not news I can use. <laughs> At least as far as, I, maybe it's just me. Is, it, is that your experience? Anyway, the first thing I do, right click in the lower right there on the taskbar and I un disconnect news and interests. I don't want to see that. I'm trying to get some work done here. Solitaire is different. 8888-ASK-LEO if you want to talk about high tech. Never did, though, answer his question because I couldn't figure it out. Why he's seeing the, the volume overlay popping up in the upper right, that's a bug. It will, You know, you'll see the volume overlay if you have a, a Windows machine. When you press uh, the function key, you, you, on a laptop, one of your function keys on your keyboard will have some, a couple of them will have speaker icons, and you press it, and you the little thing... There, there's some, there's some audio, and then I press the turn off audio, and the little overlay pops up, but it goes away. It should go away. There's something going on. He has some sort of uh, unusual driver or something. So, my only solution was to go through the um, device manager and see what sound devices he'd installed, and one by one, turn them on and off. Troubleshooting a computer, so much fun, isn't it, kids? <sighs> That's why you should just buy an iPad. At least if something goes wrong on the iPad, you know you can't fix it. <laughs> There's no pressure. It's like, oh, well, I guess that's broke. David in Ithaca, New York, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, David. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. What can I do for hey, you? I'm the psych prof at Cornell who studies disgust. My and good friend. I should recognize wow. your name by now, David. I apologize. <laughs> well, it's a common name. Um Hey, Leo, I'm calling one. I called up a, a bit over a year ago, and in that conversation, you helped me out with doing video for my intro psych class, this big intro psych class that I teach here, and a uh, thousand students signed up. You know, Wow, congratulations. Them. That's exciting. Well, hey, they, they gave me a teaching award, and I have to share it with you for your help. Oh, so, David, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Hey, it turns out that that uh, making a are you by the way just out of curiosity is Cornell now back in the classroom or are you guys still remote? Fully back in the classroom, um, masked mandates indoors and vaccine mandates. Yes, but, so that's fine. You know. Do that so that we can now get back to, into the classroom. I think that's fine. That's exactly. good. Cornell's taken a really good sort of science-based approach. I mean, some some faculty who are you know compromised with little kids don't like this. Uh, you know, it's a tough call. If you have little kids, you especially should be getting the vaccine because they can't. You got to protect them. 
<laughs> uh, don't get me started, David. I'm sure. I'm sure these conversations occur quite a bit in the faculty lounge. Oh God! So congratulations on the teaching award. That's great. And now you're back. And, and is it still a thousand kids you're teaching? And it's it's about nine hundred thirty in person. Do you do one big lecture or do you split it up? One one big lecture three times a week in the morning. Uh, and it's fun, you know. I, I like like you were just talking about. Uh, You're a performer. It, you got to put on a show if you got that many people. It it well it really is, but you know I had fun doing it from home and getting to nerd out with good video and doing all that stuff. But there really is no substitute for for them seeing you in person. No, I agree. And, I agree. And you know, just their attention. What for but, those who who. Uh, don't know, which is probably all of you. Uh, David's research, which is fascinating, is is uh, all about disgust. We have it's an evolutionary benefit uh, built in. This notion of that's disgusting. I'm not going near that. I'm not going to eat that. That saves your life. That's a good thing. That's right. But in the modern yeah. age, disgust has some interesting side effects. And uh, it, the research you're doing is, is just is fascinating. And, of course, Jonathan Haidt, who's uh, a really brilliant author, was you introduced me to him, and he's talked a little bit about that as well. I think it's a fascinating subject. We don't yeah, think actually. about it because it's disgusting, but actually it tells us a lot about uh, how right. our brain works. And in some cases where we ought to, <laughs> where it would be good to feel disgusted with the spread of disease. You know, that's We're not disgusted. What's the story? Yeah. It does not work. Hey, what about, um, you know, I, it's my theory, my thesis with uh, virtual reality. It's kind of related because, uh, and I, I didn't make this up, um, but I think it's a, it was a, a clever insight, uh, is that the problem with VR glasses is that you have, you know, you have two ways of focusing in your in your brain. One is right. the, the where your eyes, the focal point meets as your eyes meet. And that's that'll give you a distance indication, um, and then there's also uh, another method of of determining distance. There's parallax yeah. and there's focus. So say the focal point of your eyes, just like a camera, and then there's parallax. And the problem with uh, VR is that screen is at a physical distance, which your eyes go oh, I, that's two inches away, but the focus might be six feet away, and your and your brain goes, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on. These two don't match. I must have eaten something bad. I'm going to throw it up now. Does that make sense, David, or am I just nuts on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And I've heard you talk about this uh, on other podcasts as well. I I don't know if I have the same problem as you um, as bad like as bad, but I you know I love VR. I just can't play it for more than fifteen because it nauseates you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's not it's not reality. You know, we can do our best to mimic. To mimic uh, reality, but but sometimes it fails spectacularly. And and really, so much of, of psychology and sensation perception is understanding when things fail, because that really gives you a clue as to how they work. And and those failures in technology sometimes really kind of highlight what's important and what's not for your mind to 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 navigate the world. Well, and it's also important for the industry because it's their contention. Oh, no, it's just the frame rate's too slow or there's lag or we just need to make it higher resolution. It's really this theory, I can't take credit, comes from the very famous film editor and sound designer, Walter Murch, who was the first to come up with this. It's the convergence focus issue. And uh, this he came up with this 10 years ago. I remember reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Leo, I know does, does AR does, does is AR going to solve that for us? I mean, if, if it, I think so, yeah, because I'll, I'll bet on this. your brain is going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I understand. I, I am seeing something that uh, my, my eyes are focusing on something closer than my eyes are converging on. But the thing I'm converging on, which is the real world, is normal. Right. So I think the mixed reality of AR will not be. And it's been my experience. It is not as challenging as, right. as VR. I wish this didn't happen. I, I think VR is fascinating, but I think if you can't solve this, if this is something in the human biology that's incompatible with VR, that's going to be, that's going to be a showstopper for the industry. So, Well, Leo, maybe we just haven't evolved yet. Maybe, maybe the new generation will have a mutation that makes them perfectly, perfectly capable of doing everything. In VR. <laughs> that's all we need. A little mutation. Evolution hasn't stopped, has it, Dave? No, no, it still goes on. 
<laughs> so what can I do for you? You called to ask me a question, not for me to harangue you. Yeah, it's a, hopefully it's not a, a difficult question for you. I was pulling all my old hard drives and um, and re remembering that I had to back up my pictures. And, you know, from when, like, my daughter was little. Aww. And I realized I have iPhoto libraries um, that are old. And I, I wanted to, well, I said, okay, let me just hook up these external drives let me just pop them on iCloud. But iCloud only wants to do one iPhoto library. It, it won't back up more than one iPhoto library. Why do you have multiple libraries? You know, I think it was just a remnant of one. At, at some point, I uh, got a new computer okay. and I just said, well, I have them all backed up. Let me just start this. Yeah, and remember, iPhoto turned into photos. And at that point, right. there was a kind of a merge. So it is possible yeah. using them, and this is what I would do, using the modern photos to import all the photos from the other library. And is it just a matter of, like, do I have to ex export them and then no. drag them in? Or is there a way to merge? You can open the other library, I believe, and merge them. You might get duplicates. And Because I know I can open the other library, sort of one library at a time. But can I open two libraries? In no, you can't open two libraries, but you can import from the other library. Um, so let me give you the steps because this is kind of bizarre. Yeah. So you press and hold the option key as you open the Photos app. That'll let you choose which library. So pick the library you want to use. Okay. Um, and then, oh, you do have to export. Okay, I don't like this. So wait a minute. Let me, let me, yeah. I'm looking at Apple's thing. No, no, he says file import. You can go to the folder that contains the photos. So here's the here's the secret. Inside the uh, Apple Photos folder, there's a data folder in your pictures folder. That's not a that's not a single data file. Sure, that's a folder. A that's a package. Right. Yeah, right. So you right click or option click on the package, show package contents. Inside that will be a folder called Originals or Original Photos. And the, you just bring all the originals. That, you can drag that out of there and import it into your new library. What you won't get then is the modifications you've made to it, but you will have all of the photos. There's also, I'm looking at an Apple combined libraries and photos, but this is more complicated. I like my method better. I just, just yes. import from the original photos folder within the package of the photos of the second right. library. And you won't get anything, though, like, like, like you said, edits or favorites or anything like that. No, unfortunately, the metadata doesn't get saved. So maybe uh, I'll put in the show notes the Apple support article that gives you the other method that might preserve that. That's uh, 209528. You can, you can look that up as well. Um, Great. Honestly, I don't have that much metadata from those old, old things. Yeah, a lot of times, I mean, you know, the most important thing to me is the originals, to be honest. As right. long as I got the originals, right. I'm happy. How many photos do you have? Oh, man, I, you know, you know when you go crazy with your kids. So my daughter's... Yeah, that's why I ask. <laughs> the first yeah. child, there's thousands. Second child, there's a few hundred. But, you know, yeah, it's like, that's not that you love them less. Yeah, yeah, it's just not as much of a surprise every step of the way. Right. Well, I mean, I remember getting the first digital camera that I that I got probably blame you for back in the tech TV days. Mm -hmm. I blame you for a lot of the mm -hmm. nerdy, but, uh, I got my first digital. Yeah. I know when I did, cause that's when the photos go through the roof in 2001. It was an Olympus. Uh, yeah. It was like two megapixels or something, but boy, that's when I started taking a lot of pictures. Oh yeah. They're great. Now, you know, now they're like whatever, 640 by whatever. <laughs> and you're just, they oh, they're like, so oh, low res. Wow. They're so low res. You know what? You know what the real revelation to me was when MTV they were celebrating their 40th anniversary a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, oh, I'm going to watch some of the old videos. Even if you load them up on YouTube, the old Michael Jackson Thriller video is so blurry because it's standard uh -huh. definition. We have yeah, come a long way. Screen. Yeah, yeah. screens ruin it all. David, it's a pleasure. Congratulations on your award. I'm sure you deserve it. What is it? Is it Psych 101? What is it? It's Psych 101. That's right. Psych yeah. 101. Psychology. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I think it's great. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Your students are lucky to have you. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure. Oh, I got to come back. I got to go to work. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I completely forgot about you. <laughs> I'm talking to Chris Marquardt. Our photo guy, he's coming up in just a little bit, but let me get to some phone calls. Nice song, though. Thank you, Professor Laura. Jonathan on the line from Scottsdale, Arizona. Hi, Jonathan. 
Hi, Leo. I uh, love your show. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you for calling. Um, you know, real quick before I get to my call, you mentioned MTV's 45th anniversary, and there's a great documentary I saw. And, you know, when the show first launched, I believe they were in the, the team was in New York, and they actually, the New York cable system didn't carry MTV. <laughs> and they all had to drive to, I believe, New Jersey to like a diner. And they actually <laughs> watched MTV launch <laughs> on this little TV set, and they said they were surrounded by all the, um, you know, the, the, the senior citizens there for the early bird dinner. <laughs> and that's how they actually watched MTV launch. So. Mark Goodman sitting there. Oh, man, nobody knows who yeah. we are. I know. I've been there because uh, we, I don't know if you remember, we launched a cable channel called Tech TV. It was I do. in 1998. And same thing. Nobody could see it. And so we didn't have to go to a diner in Jersey, but uh, what, what, you, you had to go someplace to find it. It was not easy. What can I do for you today? So, yes, um, so I'm calling to help you. I know you like to, to help me to help people uh, spend their money. And so um, I have a 10 year old son. He just turned 10, and he's looking to graduate from his Nintendo Switch into more of a uh, gaming desktop. Oh, Dad, you're nice. You're helping him do this, huh? I am. And uh, I want to say a quick hi. Hi, Leo. Hey, what's, hi. What's, what's your favorite game these days? Probably Fortnite. I'm playing it with my friends like right now. <laughs> you, and do you play on uh, the iPhone? What do you? No, I guess not. What are you playing Fortnite on? Yeah, I play on the Switch. The Switch. Mm -hmm. Oh, you'd love it on a big screen. That's what I really want. Oh man, Dad. <laughs> I know. I bet Dad wants to play a game or two himself. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'm I'll, I'll thinking. Yeah. He might. So but, um, when it was time for me to buy a gaming machine for our son, <laughs> it's a rite of passage. Uh, I got an Asus Republic of Gamer System, ROG. Um, there are a number of companies that make gaming machines tend to be premium priced <laughs> because they're gaming machines. I did actually have one specific in mind. If I could just run the specs by you. If you hold on, I got to take a break. But hold on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is my favorite part of the show. I love buying people's stuff. All right. What are you, what are you looking at? All right. So I was over at Costco, and they have this. It's not even on their website. It just was, like, on the shelf there. But it's the Lenovo Legion. Oh, the Legions desktop. are great. I love the Legions. So you want a laptop. No, no, this is actually a desktop. Oh, they make a desktop. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a tower. Um, it has a um, Intel i5 11500F. Okay. What's the GPU? That's the most important thing. GPU? Is that the... Um, the graphics processor. It'll be an NVIDIA or... Yeah, NVIDIA Geof GeForce GTX 1660 Super. Okay. So this is a kind of an older machine. That's why you're seeing it at the big box store. Okay. Um, so, how much is it? It's just under a thousand. It's basically nine ninety nine. Yeah, it's a good so price, and that's why. The price I can afford. And yeah, uh, yeah, that's why. Six gig uh, graphics card, which was the only thing the guy the cell phone kiosk next door said that was the only thing that he said may be a little bit of an issue, but he said it's still pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, you can, so really this is basically a budget gaming system. But, you know, he's 10. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so let's be realistic. Uh, that card, 1080p, is, is the highest resolution you're going to want. Um, you might, you probably be able to get to, uh, you'll for sure get to 30 frames, which is as good as the Switch. And you might get to 60 frames. That's fine. So I think that that's a good choice. It's not good for 4K. So don't, don't go crazy on the monitor. Okay. Um, I mean, it's okay, but it will be the frame rate will slow down a lot. So, but 1080p. Remember, his switch is 1080p when he hooks it up to a TV, but it's not when he's watching, do playing it on the switch itself. Yeah, good point. And he usually watches it. He usually plays on the actual device. Yeah. So this will be this will be 1080p is fine. In fact, I still play a lot of games at 1080 because I want the higher frame rate. So I think that that's, I think actually it sounds like a good choice. I was a little worried when you said the i5 because that's the mid-range Intel, but that makes sense with the 1660. They go together. Okay. How much RAM? It's got um, 16 gigs of DDR4 Perfect. RAM. That's um, fine. There's actually, I believe, two 8 gig 
slots filled. So you, each stick is eight, so you can actually put up You could put more in. So. Yeah, I don't think, I think 16 is plenty. This is kind of, what this really is, is this would have been a top of the line gaming system two years ago. This is okay. kind of, uh, it's a it's a, it's a a perfect budget, and the price is right. It's a perfect budgeting machine. It's a perfect for a 10-year-old. Plus, by the way, it'll be good for schoolwork. Yeah, and he he does he does want to become the Mr. Beast the, the Mr. Beast of his uh, generation. <laughs> Good for him. He'll be supporting dad in a couple of years. <laughs> right, exactly. This will be okay. So that's another thing is if you're going to do Twitch streaming on it, that adds another challenge to it. This might be a little lightweight for Twitch streaming. Um, maybe not, but it might be because remember, not then you're playing the game and you're streaming the game at the same time, so it's doing more. And uh, I, I think this is going to be good for playing the game. What he could do is record. That'll be fine. It's streaming live that'll be a little more challenging. Yeah, as far as now, I don't think that's something he wants to do. He mainly wants to make videos and content and do more YouTube. This is a good choice for that, actually. Okay. That yeah. was my main question is for YouTube content and then for yep. playing games. It's, it's, yeah, it doesn't break my budget too much, which is, which is... Well, exactly. This is a good choice for 1080p kind of... Budget gaming is a really good choice, I think. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's exactly Enjoy. What I'm oh, man. What's his name? Jordan. Jordan, you have a very good father. <laughs> Thank you. He's doing a... That's pretty good. A lot of dads would say, no more Fortnite. Go to school. Do your homework. So, appreciate him. <laughs> I do. Good, Jordan. He deserves it. Oh, I'm sure he's a smart guy. You're actually smart because I think this is the this is the language of the of of his generation now, so mm -hmm. he needs he needs to be part of this. He needs to follow yeah. along. That's great, Jonathan. A pleasure talking to you. Enjoy that new machine. Go get it today. <laughs> Just wanted to say I listen to your podcast sometimes when I'm free. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, we're gonna get you programming up. next year. Programming, okay? Coding. Yeah. All right, we'll talk. Okay. Thank Take you. care. Bye, Leo. Bye. -bye. Bye. The Tech Guy Podcast brought to you this week by AT&T. If there are friends and family members you haven't talked to in a while, don't worry. It's never too late to reconnect. To help, AT&T is offering deals on the latest smartphones. It's not complicated. Everyone deserves something new. So AT&T is giving new and existing customers their best deals on every smartphone, even the latest ones. Restrictions and exceptions may apply. Visit att.com for details. Oh, look at that. My photo sensei's here, Mr. Chris Marquart. He is at sensei, S-E-N-S-E-I dot photo. He's also the host of the incredible Tips from the Top Floor podcast, a stellar professional photographer and photography coach. And each week he comes here and coaches me. And you get the benefit of it. <laughs> Hi, Chris. This actually, this topic, this is near and dear to my heart this week. <laughs> yeah, we want to talk about street photography. This is my, and, my um, kind of photography. You know, you like to travel, you like to see new places, you um, want to see what, what, what the culture is like, what the people are like in these places, and uh, of course, what it looks like in these places. You want to capture it somehow. So. Um, let me let me just go through a bunch of photos. I've put together a little gallery on Flickr um, that I guess will also be in the show notes. Yes, so everyone can follow and we'll along. This in the chat and uh, room yeah, as well. exactly. I've put together a, a gallery of, of uh, photos, and let's just go through a few and talk about a few of the, of the things that I typically think about when doing street photography. Of course, here's one um, just off a street in. Looks like, oh, it's Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik. Um, in Europe. Beautiful old medieval and, uh, stone and walls. Love that. Very, very nice. But, um, of course, it's just the city. And uh, I, I try to find interesting things to put in the picture. So uh, an example here is, I don't know where this is from. Might be Santorini. Might be oh, yeah. Chef Schauen in, uh, in Morocco. It's blue walls. It's it's interesting in itself but then there's a plant there's a bicycle so there are interesting things going on in that in that shot and that makes it kind of um yeah nice to look at it's pretty um these are it's funny because usually i think of street, street photography is having people in it but these are all of streets oh we'll get there we'll okay. get there <laughs> 
um, this I'm, I'm I'm trying to build this up. So here here's a black and white photo where the photographer went down low and took a picture uh, of a of an interesting manhole cover in the foreground. So um, plus it's rainy, which makes everything interesting. But you're right, people in shots are are interesting. So here's the first kind of a, a mention of people. Um, uh, th th this is a very iconic street. I think most people know it, especially you in the Bay Area. I know exactly That's, where um, that is. Yeah. Lombard Street in San Francisco. By the but, way, uh, as, uh, for the first time ever, an autonomous vehicle has navigated Lombard Street. <laughs> it is the I've twistiest street in the world. But it, isn't it interesting that even without seeing the actual street, all you see is green hedges and cars zigzagging, but you instantly know what it is, where it is. Um, so there, there's some some level of people in there, but of course, um, interesting streets. You find those everywhere. Um, I look for interesting light. Here we have some palm trees in the streets. It's evening sun. It's low, so we get interesting shadows and light. But let's get to people because that's kind of where it uh, where it gets interesting. Um, Often you will see black and white in street photography, and that's because some of the early street photographers, Henri Cartier-Bresson, for example, who founded the Magnum Agency, um, kind of defined that style in black and white film. And it has, uh, for, for many street photographers, still, still black and white is a go-to because um, it's very iconic. Um, in this case, there's a very narrow street somewhere um, somewhere in Europe, I guess, and the photographer has taken this picture in portrait mode, very, very thin, high photo, tall photo, to include all the interesting narrowness of that street, including all these interesting lanterns. But there are people on that. If you go further, people don't have to be the centerpiece of a street photo. This is a scooter a red scooter in the foreground. The focus is on that. So uh, there's a person in the background walking away with an umbrella. It's rainy again. Uh, have I mentioned I like rainy because the reflections really make things very interesting. So uh, the focus is on the scooter, but you have a person walking away and that is um, that, that adds an, a story element, I would say, because yeah, you might wonder, does that person, has this person been arriving here on that scooter? Is that her scooter or not? I love it. Yeah. If you, if you, if you get some interesting action, then action is always cool because that's yeah, that's local kids in this case playing soccer in, in a street. These and, are these uh, are so European. It's so funny. They really they look like my travel <laughs> photos. They're definitely from Europe. You know. So the action the action uh, makes this photo, and the other people around this are just decoration it's about the kid in the middle shooting uh some some soccer ball there yeah it's great um here's a local somewhere in asia um carrying bags of rice or something on a cart so locals at work is always a good thing it's always a, a an interesting thing because you learn something about the culture you learn something about how people work there so I like that a lot. Plus, in the background, you see all these interesting small cars. So that's something that's unusual, at least for my eyes and for many other people, I guess, as well. Plus, you learn something about the electrical infrastructure with all the wires up there. Um, I like pictures that mm. combine people and architecture. In this case, mm. you have one person in front of some interesting architecture, very contrasty. It's a black and white photo. Um, the sun is up in the sky. You can see this from the shadow. And, uh, and the photographer decided to place that person specifically in front of that dark black triangle because that is kind of like a frame made for that person. Mm -hmm. It is. It has been... It, the person belongs in that space because it has a backdrop where where it should go. So um, same with this one. There are some silhouettes of people in uh, in a in a triangle or in a, in, a, in a square or sort of a shape of sunlight, and that again gives them a place to sit. Gives them a place where that feels just right. Um, light 
interesting light, this light coming from the back. So it's backlit people, which makes them interesting because they have interesting uh, rims of light around their heads and shoulders, which separates them nicely from the background. I could I could go on and, and on, but I think we, we want to guide people to that gallery just to get some inspiration for their um, street photography. Yeah, we'll put those in the show notes. I, I don't know why I like street photography so much. I guess... Uh, when you're traveling, you that's what you're going to get, guess. right? You're going to, it's, it's, you're not going to be studio. You're not going to be, you're going to be out and about and that's what you're going to get. Well, and why, and why do you travel? That's to see other it's places, to see other cultures. So, so that's the reason you go there, I guess. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. why, why not photograph the reason why you're going there? Um, it's, it's so much fun. And then of course the challenge is doing it without getting punched. But other than that, it's really, it's really a lot of fun. That's why sometimes yeah, manhole you covers respect the, the local, the local laws yeah, of the local, exactly. local. When we were in the Medina um, in uh, Tangier in Morocco, our guide said very, very specifically, do not take pictures of people. Uh, they will not take yeah. well to it. So we were careful not to. Chris Ask Mark, we Work have a you. photo assignment uh, this month. We got a couple weeks left to take a messy picture. Yes. Illustrate the word, the idea, the concept. Messy. This is just really about getting you out there to take pictures. Chris is a big believer in, in you know, you get good only when you take a lot of pictures. So uh, if you find one you love. Tag it TG Messy and uh, upload it to Flickr. That's the photo sharing site. It's free to join. And our tech guy group is there. You'll want to upload it to the tech guy group. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will thank you. Uh, you get one a week. And in a couple of weeks, that means I guess you get two more. Chris will uh, will do a review of all the messy photos. <laughs> Chris Marquardt's at sensei.photo. Read his books. Look at his website. He's great. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Man, I'm wearing my headband. My hair's gone long. <laughs> I'm wearing a tie-dyed shirt and a, a woven poncho. That's an old song. Does that, you know, I'm wondering, Professor Laura, a song that old, well, that's, that's the 70s, that would be like, to me, like a big band song. Right, that would be that's like ancient. That would be like uh, to me or to yeah, you? to you, like Rudy Valley singing Winchester Cathedral. I mean, how how old does that song feel to you? See, I think it's different nowadays because because your dad probably played this song and it, it, rock and classic. Also it's super popular and still plays in. Movies. It's still super popular. See, super popular. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Pete, West Texas. Leo Laporte, how you doing, Pete? Hello, Pete. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, I got to do this. Now you can speak, Pete. Hello, Pete. Ah, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. What's up? Uh, Leo, thank you for taking my call. Uh, first, a long-time listener, but first-time caller. Great to have you. I have a, uh, thank you, sir. I have an HP uh, using uh, Windows 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an all-in-one, and I'm using the second monitor. I'm trying to move documents from one to the other and when i tried to do that it won't let me do the documents so you have the I second monitor set up as an extended desktop right not mirroring but, yes but extended so in theory where the border ends of the first monitor is where the border of the you know the right border of the first monitor is the left border of the second monitor and you should be able to just take a document or a window of any kind and just kind of drag it from one to the other but what happens when you try to do that it won't do it <laughs> does it bounce off what is it uh yeah it's kind of like it's bouncing off <laughs> It's like, <laughs> so you sure you're going to the right direction? Try the other direction. Because <laughs> seriously, so yeah. so remember that physically, where so the main monitor is right in front of you, and the second monitor is to your left or to your right. To my left. Okay, so you're dragging that document to the left, but if you go into the display control panel. You, you'll note that you can actually say where that monitor is, and it may be Windows, because it doesn't know where the physical monitor is, you've got it set up so it's on the right. So just out of curiosity, 
Try dragging that window, not off the left side of the screen, but off the right, and see if it starts showing up on the left side of the second monitor. If it does, easily fixed, you go into this display control panel, and you, and you can rearrange the monitors. There's a way to uh, do a monitor arrangement because you want to tell Windows, no, no, that, that second monitor is not on my right, which, by the way, is I bet you what's going on because I think that's the default. It's on my left. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So check that, uh, <laughs> that control panel because otherwise how would Windows know? Uh, you know, where that monitor is. And so that's the only thing I can think of. It should just normally, you know, you you drag it over and it should show up. Every, the same thing happened with every other uh, thing you try to drag over? Yes. Okay. I bet you, I bet you that's it. Uh, and, okay. and it also will have a button that you can press. It'll show you which is one, which is two. You can see where the menus go. There's all sorts of things. You should look at that. It's in the uh, Systems Settings Display, the dis Display Control Panel. I bet you that'll have all the answers to your questions. I keep dragging it and dragging it. It's bouncing right off. That's because it thinks that's the end of the line, right? You're dragging it to the left. It says, there's nothing over there. Try dragging it in the other direction, see? That's all I can think of. As long as it knows you have two displays and the displays are extended, not mirrored, if they're mirrored, then it's the same thing. Um, you can also get right sh right to the display settings, I think, by right-clicking on the uh, desktop, right? The display settings should be in one of those in there. Um, you'll see the numbers, one and two. If you press the Identify button on the control panel, it'll show on screen one and two. It'll show you which one it thinks is one, which one it thinks is two. And then you want to make sure that the control panel shows the layout of the monitor's as you have them laid out, I bet you that I'm. I'm gonna. It's a guess, but I'm gonna guess that's what's going on. Brenda's on the line from Redondo Beach, California. Hi, Brenda. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Thank you so much for taking my call. Thanks for calling. I'm a first time caller, and Yay. guess what? what? I'm wearing a tie dye shirt. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Then you love that cream song, right? It brought back <laughs> memories. I, was kind of laughing. <laughs> I was like, hey, and I made it myself. That's the best part. Oh, isn't that fun? I, You know, uh, tie-dye's back. Tie-dye's back. In it fact, is. Kim Schaffer yeah. has a tie-dye supplier who brought me a beautiful tie-dye shirt. So, really? Yeah, we're all... Who's? Does he sell online, Kim? Is his website up yet? I'm not sure, but if it is, it's on Etsy, and it's Wong Wei Tie-Dyes, W-O-N-G. He, he did that to himself. Don't... <laughs> Long way tie dye. Long way tie dyes. Fun. Isn't that fun? I'm gonna look at that. Well, you make your own though. That's even better. What can I? What can I do for you? Here? Well, I have an interesting question, Leo. Um, I had to turn off a phone. You know, cancel the line. Okay. And before we did that, we tried really hard to get into the phone. It was my son's. And try to get some pictures, and oh gosh, we gave it to so-called the best hackers around. <laughs> yeah, the best funny. hackers around do not put up a billboard saying, "Hey, we're the best hackers around." And that's kind of what I. <laughs> family. I was like, "Hey guys." So they weren't. So so. It, yeah. So you. Yeah. I, I apologize for asking this. But your son's not around anymore. No, we lost him in a motorcycle accident. I'm so so sorry, Brenda. Thank you. So that phone has stuff you really want, doesn't it? Oh, it's driving me nuts. Oh, sweetheart, I'm so 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 sorry. Thank you, dear. And oh, I'm like, oh gosh. I put it away because I was like, okay, I got to get into this phone because there's pictures, and he was so techy, and he was really really good. He could do anything. He was an amazing dude, and he'd take this phone, you know, and he'd put these pictures here and. He showed me so many pictures. He was a sunset guy. And so he used to just go down there and oh, um, take these pictures. What, like, was, what was his name? Matt. Matt. So you have his yeah. LG phone. I do. Do you I have, have access to his... Moment. Did he, yeah. by any chance, leave access to his Google account lying around? I, I can get into that. Okay. 
Good. I do have his email. You know, I can Good. get into So, no, 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 wait, listen. That. Listen, almost uh -huh. always with an Android phone, the photos uh -huh. are backed up to Google Photos. So when you're logged onto his Google account, go to photos.google.com. Photos. And with any okay. luck, unless he turned it off, he might have, but I bet he didn't. He's techie. Uh -huh. uh, he yeah. would have left that on, and all of those photos should be there. Ooh, I didn't even think of doing Oh, I that. pray it's the case. Too. Oh, Brenda. Yeah, me too, because I was just like, okay. I called, um, well, I went to Verizon. Yeah, they won't help you. Nobody will help you because they, people don't want to get into somebody else's phone. Because maybe Matt didn't want you to see it. But he did, and you do that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, thank you. Oh, Brenda, I'm so sorry. Just... Cross your fingers. He he didn't turn that off because then everything, every photo he ever took will be there. Oh, I hope that's it will be the there. Case. I that pray be that's the case. Oh gosh, yeah, it's just really hard because I didn't. I knew his old um, code, and then he had to replace his phone because these phones that they had, him and my husband, it had a glitch where it would just start looping, and if it did that, you automatically got you know a refurb. And so he put everything on his new phone, but he didn't tell mom, besides his swish or whatever he did to open it, what the numbers would be in case something would happen. We just didn't think of it. I know. I keep meaning to do that. So there's some other things you might look at. LG okay. phones, not all of them. Some of them have support SD cards. You know, little memory Aww. cards. So on the f now, if you brought it to somebody halfway intelligent, not even the best hacker around, they would have, okay. I think, ex looked and see if it's on the SD card. But in case they didn't, there there might be on the phone, and the, it's hard to tell. You, you could Google yeah. the name of that phone, the brand. You know, it's LG, whatever. But uh, uh -huh. figure out what model it is, and then there'll be just like there's a SIM card slot. There might be a second slot that you use a paper clip to get into, or it might be in the same slot as the SIM card slot. So you want to see okay. if there's, and now not it's not necessarily the case that he put the photos on that SD card. You have to say yes when you put the card in, and, and then they'll say, "Oh, do you want me to store photos there?" But he might have. That's another possibility. I think, that, frankly, the photos.google.com is your best bet. Okay. I hope so. Oh, I'm crossing my fingers for you. How long ago did he Thank pass? You, it's been um, somehow happened two and a half years ago. You never I'm get over it. it. <laughs> I'm sure you never get over it. No, you don't. Anybody who has kids, it's their, you know, my wife used to have a, a pillow that said, when you decide to have a kid, you decide to have your heart live outside your body. And it's really. Jeez, no kidding. There's nothing. Uh, I, oh, my dear. <sighs> All us parents are right with you. You hang in there. Thank you, dear. Yeah, take care, Brenda. My call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Love okay, you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. I often mention uh, techguylabs.com. That's the website. That's where the show notes live. If there's a link... If there's information, we'll put it up there. Uh, the chat room often comes up with additional links and information. TechGuyLabs.com. James DeRuvo's writing it all down, putting it up there. We also put audio and video from the shows after the fact. This is 1,828. 1,828. Um, if you go to that website, you should be able to find anything you want there. Let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of um, giving your heirs access to your stuff. Our phones and our computers are pretty well protected these days because, of course, hackers, but also uh, protected in death. Uh, often it, you can't get into these devices, and that can be a problem for your heirs. Even if you're young, <laughs> you should probably make provisions so that uh, your parents, if you're a young person, or your children, if you're an older person, or your executor of your estate can get into this stuff. You don't want just anybody to get into it. And it's, so it's a little tricky. I would, uh, I should be doing this uh, uh, as, as anybody should be. Um, 
I think one possibility I've considered, uh, you know, so I, my wife knows the login to my phone, the password to my phone. She knows, probably doesn't know the password to my password manager, my password vault. And that would really be the, the key thing for her to get so that she could get to bank accounts, savings and retirement accounts, all of that stuff. Uh, so she does, I have given her provisional access, and most password managers will do this through an emergency access technique. So we'll put links in the show notes to some of the big password managers. LastPass does this. One, first one password does it. Bitwarden, our sponsor, does it. Uh, there's an emergency access routine. Um, and I've set this up so that if something happens to, my, to me, my wife can ask for emergency access. What will happen is, as soon as she asks for it, the password manager will then say, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to just give it to you. Maybe he's not dead. Maybe uh, maybe he took off. <laughs> you know, maybe you, you had a bad breakup. So I'm not just going to give it to you. First, I'm going to sell, send an email to the, they call it the grantor, the person who grants the emergency access, and make sure he's okay with this. And you can set, and on many of these, you could set a oh, one day, two days, five days. If I don't answer in five days, yeah, I'm dead. Please grant emergency access. So that's what I've set up with my password vault. And then make sure you tell your grantee, the person you give this access to, to do that, to check, should anything happen to you. And you might want in that password vault put other things because password vaults don't typically have the password to get into your phone uh, the password to get into your computer. So you might want to add that as well. So check and see. If it, it's another really good reason to use a password manager. It's a trusted place. You could put all of this stuff, all these login credentials for your banking and so forth. And as a side benefit, not only is it remembering it for you, it can pass it along to your heirs should anything happen to you. I know nobody wants to think about that. Um, but I think it's a very important thing to mention. If, on the other hand, uh, my wife ties me up and sticks me in the basement, well, all bets are off. <laughs> She'd have to do it for five days. <laughs> I'm not giving you any ideas, Lisa. I'm just, I'm just explaining how this works. <laughs> I trust her. And she actually has access to almost everything. The other option, and uh, I think I probably should do this, is just to write it all down, put it in an envelope, it says, in case of my death... And put it somewhere safe, a safe deposit box, something your your heirs and executors have access to. Maybe put it with your will, and then that way they can get into the stuff. You just want to keep it from everybody else uh, for obvious reasons. 8888 Ask Leo. It's not something anybody wants to think about, but it is something you know we're all going to deal with. In fact, it's an issue with social media as well. Facebook has a uh, way that you can contact them. And say, hey, look, you know, my father's passed away. I'd like to uh, turn his page into a memorial. And it, it's actually, they call it memorializing the account. It's actually, uh, I'm glad Facebook does this. You can request to memorialize or delete an account if you want to delete it. I think it's nice to have that account there as a, as a place people can leave their memories. And that's kind of how that works, you know. So if you if you're if you're thinking about that if you've lost somebody and you know they had a Facebook account rather than just leave it there which is I guess okay you can request to memorialize that account and I would imagine I don't know what I'm sure Twitter has something similar 8888 ask Leo Victor's on the line from Columbia South Carolina hi Victor Hi Leo thank you for for taking my call and if I can just say this before I go on with my problem I just did that with my daughter I gave her my last pass password my computer password and some other passwords that you might need. You Isn't know, that a good idea? You don't want to think about this, but at the same time, think about what it would be like for them if you suddenly died and they didn't have access to all that. What a nightmare. That's, that, those, those, those are my thoughts. Yep. It, you know, like, like if I was diagnosed with something and I had some time, I could take care of it. But something sudden or unexpected, I wouldn't have time. We don't always get time. <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you did that. That's great. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, uh, from you, I'm going to take that as a compliment. I felt good about it before, but I feel yeah. better about it now. Very so, smart. I think very wise, yeah. yeah. 
Leo, so let me tell you about the thing that I'm not so smart about. Uh, I have um, um, a Google Home. De- I have a Google Home device in every room. Yep. And and I've used it to play music and and you know background music in every in every room. Uh, but what has happened is that I can no longer find my my any of those devices on my computer. I can find them on my. I can cast from my phone, no problem. But from my computer, my computer, you know, through uh, uh, Chrome, my computer only sees from the from the casting tab only sees my Chromecast huh. on my TV. It doesn't see my Google Home device, any of them. Um, and you have one Wi-Fi network, right? You don't have multiple networks. Well, I have. Um, I've tried that. I tr- have. Uh, I think they call it dual band. I have five G and then the, whatever the regular one is. Yeah. And. And they're all on the 5G. Everything is on okay. the 5G. Okay. Uh, sometimes some devices, some IoT devices, I mean, maybe the case with Google Home, can't do 5G. So they may be on the 2.4 spectrum, which would explain this. Um, my suggestion is, and there'll be a setting in your router to do this, use the same uh, name, the same, the, technically it's called the SSID. I've done that, the same Okay. The same, yeah, sometimes the routers are set up with, you know, my router dash 5G, my router dot 2 dash 2.4. I don't like that. Make it all the same. Let the device choose. And it should act uh, in many routers there is a setting to say and unify these networks so that they're they're transparent to either. Um you should be able to do that in Chrome. I'm surprised you can't. When what you else? do that? When you say do that, what, what you should you be able to do? see them in your Chrome browser. Nope, doesn't work. And I've installed the latest, I've updated my Chrome, uh, you know, updated the browser. Uh, I've rebooted all of the, um, uh, all, you know, all of the, uh, all, all of the indi- devices individually. And, and like I say, I can... I can and you want to see them, them in order to send the music, I presume, right? Correct. Huh. I, um, see, the, I see the Chrome, Chromecast. I have, cause I have Chromecast devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in theory, all of those other devices are also cast devices. Correct. So you can see them in the Google Home app, no problem. Correct. But for some reason, they're not showing up on the computer. Right. Boy, oh, that's I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have to give you ten bucks back because I have no I have no idea uh, why that would be if you're on the same network. Um. You, you might try putting that computer on the 2.4 gigahertz and just see. Uh, oh, I know one thing. It does use a Bluetooth to signal presence. So make sure you turn Bluetooth on on the computer. Scooter X oh. mentioned that. I forgot about that. It It's a weird mix of three different ways to see a Google Home device. There's actually inaudible audio tones. There's Bluetooth and there's Wi-Fi. And you want to make sure all three are, are available. So, yeah, try turning on Bluetooth. Okay. You don't have to join your Bluetooth network or anything, but but yeah. try turning on the Bluetooth. As we speak, I just turned it on. I mean, I just opened it up, and it is it is on. Okay. So uh, that was my best uh, shot. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> keep listening. Somebody will call or somebody will mention it in the chat, and we'll figure it out. And if I see something... Uh, I'll let you know. It sees your Chromecast. It just doesn't see your Google Assistant, your home devices. Correct. Yeah. Correct. None, none of them. None of them. I have five of them, and it doesn't see any of them. Uh, oh, here's one Scooter X found. This is wild. Okay. In Chrome, so you get to this by Chrome colon slash slash flags. There's a special page for settings. It's the flags page. So instead of typing, typing HTTPS, et cetera, et cetera, you type Chrome, colon, slash, slash, flags. You'll see a long list of things. Search for load media router component extension. Oh, my God. If you just search for... If you, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you just search for media router, it'll show up as one of the choices. Make sure that's enabled. That's a wild one. Wow. I'll try anything. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I, thank you, Scooter X. Somebody said Scooter X ought to be on the payroll. Uh, he ought to be. He's one of our most active chatters. He's one of our moderators and he's got massive Google foo. He says it worked. He said, I had the same issue and this is how I fixed it. 
I'll put a link in the show notes as well. If, if I know that was a little bit of a weird solution. It's, Thank you much. And instead of sending me back the $10, you can give it to him. I will. Scooter X gets the 10 bucks. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> have a great, have a great day. Oh, inactive account manager. That's nice. Oh, I like that. I'll have to do that too. That's a good one. Thank you to uh, our Discord. Let's find our Discord. There it is. Um, thank you to N48FR. N48FR. Google's inactive account manager. Hey, Rod Pyle. How are you, sir? Hello. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. I have your pictures. Was that? Did they go up this week and I didn't even know it? No, they're going up on the 15th. Oh, that's what I thought. So that's what I figured. So these pictures are just uh, simulations. Yeah, well, the, the so that's the crew in training. Ah. And then, yeah, the other one's just cool. demonstration. But I wanted to show that bubble because that's that <laughs> that's a really is cool nice. Feature. I yeah, love it? that. Yeah. That is really I'd, cool. I'd almost go for that, you know? Oh, yeah, just because the view must yeah. be spectacular. Yeah, you in see that days. sometimes in sci fi, they'll have. You know, special places to go. <laughs> well, and it, it, what kind of interests me about this is there's so much in the details of this that if you had told me this is a crew when I was, you know, steeped in in the Apollo lore and all that engineer talk and those guys that talk monotone and clipped acronyms and all that, I would have said you can't do that. <laughs> Especially not just some rich guy. But here we are, Leo Laporte. The tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. The phone number. Cindy, Cindy's on the line from Valdosta, Georgia. Hello, Cindy. Hey. Hey, welcome. What can I do for you? How, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, fabulous. Wonderful. You have <laughs> I, I, you have a phone problem, I hear. I, I do. Okay. Um, I was trying to um, find and delete prior networks, but I, I can't pull anything up. So prior Wi-Fi networks? That were joined. Yeah. Um, and it's an iPhone? It is. So, yeah, I do this periodically, too, because your computer and your iPhone both remember other networks that they've been on. Right. And right. so you'll see a list of them. And maybe you don't, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter that they're there, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you a good reason to get rid of some of them. Um, mm -hmm. My wife, uh, we're, we're customers of Comcast's Xfinity service. And one of the things Comcast does is if you have an Xfinity router, they'll open it up to public access. And then when you wander around town, you can get basically Wi-Fi from your neighbors, which is, I think, in theory, a good idea. But my neighbors seem to have left it on without giving it any internet. So every time I do that, I lose my internet. I join their network and I have no internet. So I don't I don't I want to forget that network. I don't want it to ever see Xfinity and log into it. So that's a good reason to go into a network and get rid of it. Um but you're saying you can't remove these. Well, so I I know that they were attached to this particular phone historically. Yeah, um, that's how it knows about it. Yeah. Right, right. But... So it shows up in the... there's there When you're looking at your Wi-Fi settings, there's the one you're on, but there'll be a second blob of lists of them called My Networks. They're not really um, your networks. They're networks you've joined. And on the far right, there's an I button that if you tap it, that's the information button. There should be... A button that says, forget this. I don't want it. Right. Well, I can never get to the Mind Network section. Oh. Um, I know, like, I, I never use my Wi-Fi um, because of the ex-husband. Oh. And so. Oh. You know, it's, a, know it's so it. sad how often this comes up. Yeah, Ugh. it really is. It's tragic. Guys, um, knock it off. Uh, you know, just start, everybody move on. Yeah, okay. just move on. So when you, okay, so you go into your phone, you're not using Wi-Fi. It's, Correct. It's turned off. Right. So when it's turned off, nothing will show up. 
So just turn it on. You don't have to actually join any of these networks. Just turn it on. Right. And then you should see my networks. If you don't, I'm, then I don't know what's going on. I mean, that's I'm looking at my phone right now. And Which iPhone is it? Um, it's an iPhone 8. 8, okay. And you're on iOS 13, 14, 12? 14. 14, good. So you're on the most recent iOS. Well, I think there's a newer one because of the hack. I think there's a 14.7. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're always updating it. I don't know what there the current... There was a, a patch a few Good for ago. you. And you do your patches, right? Good. I, no, well, <laughs> I'm, good about it, <laughs> I, I'm on 14.7.1. That's the most up-to-date. So you have... And I have... That shouldn't make I any difference. Done that one yet. Okay, do always do those when you can because it's a good idea. But you're right; you have to be on Wi-Fi to yeah. do it. So if you've got Wi-Fi turned on, you don't see that blob of other networks you've been on ever. You'll see networks that you can join. That's normal. There's those no. you those you can't get rid of. There's no way to forget those because that's just the the phone seeing those. But there should be a set of networks that you don't see, but that you've once been in, and you should be able to forget that network. Right. And you can't. Correct. The only other thing I can think of is it gets these networks from, do you have a Mac or an iPad? I do, but given the prior situation, I have not associated my last two iPhones with any of my computers. Um, if they're on the same iCloud keychain, it can get those and will restore those from the Mac or the iPad. Hang on, I'll talk some more to you off the air. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So I'm sorry, I had a had a break there. So no, that's okay. You aren't. You only what what devices are on your iCloud right now? Um. Does he X? Have, he doesn't have any of your i. He's not logged into your iCloud anywhere, is he? Okay. Well, so historically, and I haven't gotten any new computers that he didn't have access to. So it's his iCloud. The divorce. Well, no, it was mine, specifically. Oh, good. But, um, but I, I don't I don't connect any of my new devices to any of the old things because he created a network in the house for my business <laughs> that had my computers on it, too, and then later I found out he was He was logging in. He was. He yeah. was remotely accessing my computer. Nice. And, and I don't care. I didn't care. It was just. It's rude. It was just, it's, <laughs> it's rude. Gross. It was just it's gross. gross. Get off of my yeah. stuff, you. <laughs> so you probably want to go through, for hygiene purposes, you want to go through everything. Change the passwords. Change the password to your Wi-Fi. Um, well, and that's the thing. I, I, I haven't accessed a Wi-Fi um that was associated with any of those old devices. It, but that said... Um, you still see it. I don't see anything. I don't, I don't get to the point where I can see... You don't want to use Wi-Fi anymore. You've been, you've been turned off to Wi-Fi. I, I've, been, I've been burned. You've been burned. It's, it, is, it is the case that you could, if you know how, go into those routers and change the password... Turn off wide area network administration and change the password, and he would no longer have access to it, which is probably a good thing to do. I would recommend you do that. Then you could use those Wi-Fi devices safely. Now, if he's put, do you think he's put malware on any of your machines? I, has I he, do. Has he's um, had physical access to machines after the breakup? Um, well, it was right before he was booted. Ah, so he may have put something on there uh, proactively. All right, so that is more of a problem. You really do need to wipe those machines off before you use them. Right. He doesn't need access to your Wi-Fi network. If he has remote access to your machine, he can get in anyway. Correct. Because they're, the, they're on the Internet. So uh, anytime you go on the Internet, if those machines have been compromised, you are at risk. So don't... So don't take take that seriously. Do want to, you want to make sure that all that stuff's been cleared off? Easiest way to do it: back up your data, reformat those all those systems, and just start from scratch. Okay. I would highly okay. recommend that if you're worried about it. Now, and, you know, it doesn't matter that you can see those devices on your phone. Mm -hmm. If they're on, you'll see them. 
Just like if you're walking downtown, you'll see the Starbucks and all that stuff. That's just the phone saying, here, here's some networks I can join. What you want to make sure is the automatically join this network is turned off. So right. then it won't join it without your permission. Right. Uh, and then I think you're all right. I mean, I wish I had, Cindy, if I'd had the time, and maybe you can find a, um, a tech person who can, who can work with you. It would really okay. be worth it. Just get that scumbag out of everything. I know. Just get yeah. them out of that. But like the trusted certificates on this phone, too, I it says it has 13 trusted certificates, but I can't go. Was this it. his phone at some point? It was not. Um, well, how was he able yeah. to put certificates on there? That's weird. So the way, so those certificates, you go, you tap your uh, Apple ID. It's at the very top of settings. And you should see all those uh, certificates. And at any point you see one that you don't like, you should be able to delete it. Okay. And well, I would. Any certificate you didn't install, right. get rid of. Right. Um, the thing is, is I can't get to the certificates to even see what they are. Maybe it's because I'm not turning on Apple ID, but I've never associated this phone yeah, that's with why. email or iTunes yeah. either way. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're stuck in this horrible place where you can't trust anything. I'm out of time, unfortunately. He's a rocket man. He's a spaceman. He's our guy in space. Mr. Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of the great Ad Astra magazine, author of many wonderful books about space, Space 2.0, Interplanetary Robots, Amazing Stories of the Space Age. Hello, Rod. Hey, and I'd, I'd be even more your spaceman if I had actually won a seat on Inspiration 4, but alas. Oh. Not. So tell me about this, because it's it's uh, it's going to go up this week. It's week. This week, yeah. It's on Wednesday, September 15th, and it'll be at 8 p.m. Well, well, the launch window opens 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. This is, that according be... to the website, the first all-civilian mission going into orbit. Not counting, you know, these suborbital things that Richard Branson and Jeff right. Bezos did. This is, this is, and it's to benefit a charity, right? Yeah, and and it is orbit. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Not only is it orbit, it's a very high orbit. In oh. fact, it's the highest, uh, as far as I can tell, it's the highest that any crewed spaceflight has flown since the last Hubble service mission wow. in 2009. So it's way up there. And they're going to have a hell of a view through that hemispherical bubble, which is going to. Oh, be let me show the, the picture because you sent me a the picture adapter. of this bubble. It, interestingly, it's 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 adjacent to the toilet. But, you know, <laughs> so you take what uh, you can get for the for the good seats. Yeah, well, there's limited space uh, on these. Yeah. Uh, so this is a uh, SpaceX mission. This is Elon Musk's Musk's yes. SpaceX. Uh, what what will it be the the Dragon that they'll be flying? Yeah, this is a Crew Dragon. It's been used once for the Crew One mission, and so uh, the booster is also a veteran. It's been used once. So on the one hand, you look at rockets and you think, oh, I don't want to fly a used, used rocket. rocket. But you know it works, right? <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. And that that bubble is removable, so they'll they'll keep it. You know, they just close that cap back up when they're done because this isn't docking with the with the uh, space station. This is just going up for three days. They'll stay in orbit and do the oh, tourist thing and come home. They are doing some biomedical research <sighs> for Baylor University and Cornell. And I would uh, love to be on this flight, wouldn't you? I mean, obviously you would. I, I, I have to say I would. Oh, and, and it's also, as far as I can, uh, can recall, it's the first civilian splash bat, splashdown ever. They're, so they're going to land in the WADA, is, water. They are going to land in the Atlantic. Okay. And, you know, except for the fact that Jared Isaacman, the... Uh, Commander is, is a billionaire and bought the flight. I mean, the rest of these people are you and me. You How know, did he choose them? Not that special. Well, uh, Isaacman came up with the idea, and he was working with St. Jude's, had been for years, and got in touch with SpaceX. And by the way, there's a fantastic uh, mini documentary series on Netflix called Countdown, which is uh, documenting this. They've been two, done two episodes so far, and having done you know reality TV in my past, I'm a pretty harsh critic, and it's. A, a sensational documentary. I mean, the scoring is beautiful. There's plenty of tearjerker moments. They go back and look at the the foibles and difficulties of of crewed spaceflight, and it's cute because they they videotape the Zoom sessions where each of these people heard that they were selected. Oh, neat. And Haley Arsenux, I, I think I got her name right, the one on the lower right there, who's the bone cancer survivor that 
works at St. Jude's, her first question was, are we going to the moon? <laughs> So she had a little bit of an educational sure. curve there. But sure. So yeah, let's cute. go to the moon. Forget all. Let's go to the moon. <laughs> so um, it, it's and, and this, you know, this is only possible because of SpaceX. If it wasn't for them coming along with this technology, lowering the prices this way, proving this equipment, seasoning this equipment, um, this wouldn't be happening. How much did he pay for this? Lots, right? Million dollars 50. for the actual show. Wow. I think fifty-five million dollars for the for the. Buy. So he's he's one of them, uh, uh, you know, billionaires uh, from uh, the tech industry. Yeah, and he's interesting. I mean, he's he's thirty-eight. He's also a pilot, right? I mean, he's he does he has six thousand hours of flight time. A lot of that military jets because years ago, after he dropped out of high school at age fifteen to pursue his dream of selling credit card processing terminals, he started a company <laughs> to do to contract training in military jets to the Air Force, which feels a little counterintuitive, but they needed the extra capacity, I guess. And he bought 100 military jets over the next few years, which is the largest private Air Force in the world, what? apparently. And uh, contract out that time. And of course, in that process, you know, was able to to uh, indulge his hobby of, of flying. So wow. he's he's quite the accomplished pilot. No, I would trust so him. I would go up with him. I would feel well, confident. Exactly. Yeah. And he's been trained for all the backup systems on the capsule. So it's not like they're not flying without somebody seasoned. Um, Cyan Proctor, who won the contest that they were showing on the Super Bowl many, many months ago, uh, is his co-pilot. She's in the second seat. She has some flight experience, but but most of her training, as I understand it, was was with SpaceX for this. She's 51. She has a master's degree in geoscience and a PhD in science and education. Born in Guam, interestingly, African American astronaut, only the fourth woman of 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 that uh, cultural inclination to to be part of this. She's participated in a lot of analog missions, but doesn't have any formal training for this. She did apply to be an astronaut years ago and didn't make the cut. So this is this is her dream fulfillment. Uh, do, how much, I mean, the Richard Branson's flight had required a pilot. Jeff right. Bezos' flight was pretty much autonomous. How much yeah. flying do you have to do in Inspiration4? Well, they say not a lot, but you want somebody there to push the right buttons if something fails, right? Right. If and you, you want a reboot. backup in case Jared goes, yeah. I'm sick as a dog. You take right. it. <laughs> I'm going to take a nap. You bring it home. <laughs> you take I it, mean, Dr. It, Proctor. This I is straight is out of this. This is like the best. This is like Lost in Space or you know, yeah. the best space sci-fi. This is a great cast. They've got Haley, who works at St. Jude, the cancer survivor. They've got the geologist uh, as the in the second seat, Chris Sembrowski. What's his What's now, his background? Well, he's interesting. So he's 41, and he's a very mild mannered looking guy. And uh, when they when they told him on the Zoom call you're selected, he just sat there. And the guy from uh, for SpaceX thought that the screen had frozen up. <laughs> he couldn't believe moving. it. And they said, "Are you okay?" And he went. Uh, uh, yeah, and you'll see all this if you watch the document. He was in the Air Force. He's he's got he a was. bachelor's in aeronautics. I mean, he's he's certainly qualified. Um, well, it's funny because they kind of last they list the the Air Force affiliation after the fact that he's a data engineer for Lockheed Martin, who I believe is working on and a space craft. camp counselor and a space camp <laughs> counselor, right? <laughs> just, you know, it's funny that you put that first, but that's just just good press. I so just he, love he, Haley Arsenault. I think the cancer oh, survivor works at St. Jude's. Twenty nine years old, young woman. I just this is going to be so fun to watch. So it's it's the fifteenth. If there's no slips. That's the problem is, a, is these are always kind of, you know, as yeah. long as everything's okay. But is this Wednesday? Um, she has a I, prosthetic implant, which will be a first in flight. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they what? had to remove a piece of her femur because of the cancer when she was very young. Oh. And again, this documentary. And that was at St. Jude's, right? That they did St. that. St. Jude's, this yeah. tape of her as a kid when they're telling her she's going to be okay and mom's crying and we're crying oh. and all this. And then they, they track her growing up. Oh, I have to watch the documentary. It's it's great. Um, I, mean, I am really excited is. about this. This is really this well, is what this, is, this is really going into exactly. Space. You know, I mean, Branson was was fun and interesting, and the Bezos flight was great. But this is that moment I think that we've all thought about for so long. And like you said, this is really science fiction coming true, coming down to earth, if you will, where it's just these normal people 
A three-hour cruise on this flight. A three-day orbit. You can bet that the people involved with this are being really. I mean, they're always careful for human space flight, but you got to get everything absolutely. This one you want to get. Why you always want to get. So, what's the name of that documentary? I want to watch that. It's called Countdown: Inspiration for a Mission to Space. It's on Netflix, and they've done two episodes. I think they're doing four. So they parked it right before the flight oh, here, which is so smart. brilliant marketing. And it so is, smart. again, it is so well done. I, I can't recommend it enough. I, uh, I I sat down to watch it, kind of like, okay, another space documentary. We'll see how they do it. And I was in tears in about I'm, 10 minutes. I'm watching it uh, <laughs> tonight, so I'm ready for Wednesday. Great. Mission to Space. Thank you, Thank Rod you. Pyle, Spaceman. Someday you and I will get to go up. And look out that little window. We better hurry up. I know. <laughs> I don't think they'd actually, I think I'm too old. They won't let me up there. I got, I, well, they'll let you if you pay for it. We just have to see if we can fit our walkers through the hatch. How, um, so he paid for everything. Jared did. Yeah. It's um, all out of his pocket. Yeah, uh, and then everybody else is just go, getting to go for fun. Yeah. Wow. And and you couldn't pick a better name than inspiration. I mean, I realize oh, I'm man. gushing a bit effusively here, and I'm usually a little more jaded than that. But this one really is special, I think, and it, oh, it's got it perfectly. It's this is made for TV, man. This is a movie yeah. movie in the making. Even though, yeah, even though, for the next few <laughs> years, these people have assured media careers. Yeah. Maybe one element up the host of Jeopardy or something. So, are, is there going to be like there'll be a lot of cameras? How, how will we be able? How much will we be able to watch it live? I guess we. I mean, SpaceX does a good job of streaming their stuff. Um, yeah, I'm sure the cameras mounted inside. The question is, you know, how how will it be like Big be Brother on, or will? <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, okay, we're voting you out of the capsule. Take a hike. Um, I, I think there will be uh, scheduled transmissions, but they haven't published a schedule yet that I've seen. But yeah, I definitely want to see that. And so cool. again, you know, after seeing them hear the news that they're going to be able to see them actually experience. Yeah, I want to see this documentary. First minutes of that. Yeah, um, that's it. Be does really it does? I mean, the whole thing looks like a movie. From the way the capsule it, it, looks, the spacesuits look, look real. Does the it? crew, yeah. I mean, you know, oh, and, this, and the spacesuits with those with those those knee boots, right? Yeah. <laughs> if this were Star probably. Trek, I, I'd be worried if I were Chris. He looks like the red shirt guy. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. Don't Chris, if they ask <laughs> you to go to a landing party, stay on the ship. No, I'm just teasing. Just wear a white shirt. Yeah. Be okay. I'm just teasing. I mean, yeah. don't they? They look. They're so telegenic. They are, and 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 Cyan's a really wonderful person. She's been involved with the NSS for a time, and she speaks quite a bit. She works with kids. She deserves to be. I mean, everybody. Yeah. It looks like everybody on this really deserves to be there. As, as, yeah. Not as much as you and me, but you know, pretty good, <laughs> pretty good. And bless well, Jared. I've been hanging for, around for for fourteen years longer than Cyan. Darn it! So I <laughs> darn it. I should have gotten my shot. But but, but uh, you know, good for Jared for making this about. Uh, charity and and it's really making it inspirational i think it's great generosity through this whole process i mean nobody's perfect but from everything i've read from everything in the show in this doc he really did it because he's a true believer in not just space flight but in saint jude's and their mission and in doing the right thing and this is a real game changer this opens a lot of things up i don't think we're going to have flights like this every couple of months but it does show that one person, like with Musk in a smaller way, one person with vision and the means and the drive can yeah. make these things happen. Yeah. And that really was really exciting. The case in the past. Well, we'll yeah. talk about it. Uh, they'll be back by next week, right? It's only three days. Yeah, it's only three days. So yeah. Friday, yeah. Wow. I'm excited now. You, I, yeah, me too. And I, I can't wait to hear what to think it. of the show. Yeah. Oh, I'm watching it tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have will enjoy it. It got so. Our, our media consumption got so complicated, I actually has to start a spreadsheet. <laughs> let me just put this. Serious? Yeah, let me just, it's an obsidian. I just have to put what I want to watch. Okay, how many have, entries are there for The Bachelor in there? <laughs> None, zero. Good. But there's, there's want to watch, watching, because Lisa and I would sit down and say, well, what are we, what are we watching? What, are we, what, what can we watch episode two of? It's just kind of complicated, so I had to kind of yeah. automate the thing. That is that is so you. <laughs> That's pathetic. All right, Rod. Have a great week. You too. Take All care. Right, take care. This show goes too fast. Thank you, time. Uh, thank you to Professor Laura, our musical director. 
great job today, Laura, bringing back the oldies but goodies. Uh, thanks, of course, to Kim Schaffer, our phone angel. She gets you on the air, prepares you for your appearance on national radio. Thanks most of all to those of you who call and listen. We couldn't do it without you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Anne from Lynn, Massachusetts is next. Hi, Anne. Hi, Leo. I have an old laptop that runs Vista, and it has the original browser on it, and I can't connect to the Internet, and I've tried it at a coffee shop hotspot, and I also have my own hotspot at home. I just can't connect to the Internet. How can I surf the net on that? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> the first thing I would say is you shouldn't. Because because Vista is so old uh, that it is not it is no longer secure, and in fact that's probably why you can't get online anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft discontinued support for browsers on Vista April 2019 to give you to give you some idea. Uh, they really want you to upgrade, and what they'd like you to do is upgrade. Well, what they'd really like you to do is buy a new computer, but I but that's too much. So let's not let's not make let's not make that happen. It's been ten years. That computer is probably thirteen years old. It is. Yeah. So it's been a long time. You it's, you've got a lot of good use out of it. My strong suggestion is, if you don't want to get a new computer, in fact, I think maybe what do you do with your uh, computer? What do you like to get online and surf? I just the the net yeah. and send out some emails. I'm not a real tech person, so just something you know, really easy and simple. Yeah, and I don't want you to get uh, to use it and then get, you know, a Trojan horse on there, which gets steals your banking passwords. I you, I really don't want you to use this thing online. So I think this is a message from above, and by above I mean uh, Microsoft, that you probably shouldn't be using this online. Could you, would you be willing to spend just a few hundred dollars to get a, a, a Chromebook, a new computer? Oh, sure. Um, the thing is, I don't have any banking passwords on there. I just use it to surf the net and have fun and send out a few emails. So I was just wondering if there's anything I could do just to get it going to do that. Yeah. Um, you, it's such an old computer. I don't even know if Windows 10 would install, but that would be one thing to try okay. is see if you can install. You need to install a newer operating system. Not only is Vista out of date, its successor, Windows XP, is out of date. It's no longer supported either. They really want to move you uh, to, at the very least, Windows 7, possibly Windows 8. I would say Windows 10. The other thing you could do is and this would be an interesting experiment, uh, is put an opera, a free operating system on it called Linux, which is designed in many cases for older machines like yours. Mm -hmm. I bet you don't have a lot of memory on that machine, uh, probably two gigs of RAM. You don't have a lot of storage, the hard drives. It must be very slow. Uh, it Actually, it wasn't. It's an Acer computer, and I didn't use it all that much. Yeah. But I really enjoy it. It's it's easy to carry around. It's not too heavy. Um, I like the way it looks. I like the way it feels. So even if I could get it going again, I mean, I admit I do have a tablet. I do have a smartphone. Oh, okay. So you are you have something more up to date. Acer makes, by the way, very nice Chromebooks. Best Chromebooks in the business. Uh, they start at a couple of hundred bucks, okay. and I think it would be faster. It would be more reliable. And most importantly, from my point of view, it would be more secure. Um, you don't do banking on it. That's good. Do you ever buy anything on it? No. No, it's just you're really going around websites and email. That's right. Yeah. yeah. How, could we, how could we get that thing working again? <laughs> that's I mean, the, asking you. Yeah. I mean, if I, if, I were, if I were around, I would say, well, let me come over. I'll put some Linux on it because that's really... That's one quick way to do it. And, and people go, well, Linux, no, you know, if you're not a sophisticate, you shouldn't use it. That's really not true. Modern Linuxes are just as easy, if not easier, to use in Windows. I don't think you'd have a problem with that. Um, do, how techy are you techy enough to download? And No, probably not. I don't want to put no. you through that. I don't want to put you through that. Um, see what Microsoft, hit the Windows key and type update and see if Microsoft offers you an upgrade 
to a more version, recent version of Windows. Probably cost a hundred bucks. Uh, Windows 10 you can get for a hundred bucks, thereabouts, maybe a hundred thirty. Um, if it would run on it, I would say go ahead. The problem is the 13 year old PC, I don't know if you can get anything that's going to run on it. Okay. That's the problem. That's the problem. You're sure it's online, right? You, you're on Wi Fi? Oh, um, yeah. It used to work, but it stopped working? That's right. And when I put it um, on the like the hot spot on the coffee shop, it comes up in the available networks, but it just oh. won't connect. Yeah, I think that's Microsoft saying, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. um, you might try. I mean, this might work. The problem is that original browser Internet Explorer definitely won't go online anymore. So you might. The problem is, how are we going to get how are we going to get another browser on there if you can't get online? <laughs> that's right. Um, Microsoft has an Edge browser that's much more modern and much more secure. Will it run on Vista? I don't know. I doubt it. But you might try that. Might Google Chrome might run. There are other browsers that probably would run. Uh, but Microsoft's telling you, no, we're not going to let you use this to go online because it really it isn't safe anymore. Okay. Yeah, yeah anything. it's an old IE, uh, an old Internet Explorer, and it stopped working. Mm. Of, <laughs> I think I bring uh, the term recycle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I abuse. Well, the, the funny thing is, uh, this tech, this kind of hardware doesn't wear out. There's no nothing to wear out, and so it keeps on going forever and ever. What wears out is it's you know the companies that make the software for it get tired of it. They say, well, we don't want to really support this anymore. So, so a, a Vista service pack one won't help that. Well, do all of the service packs you can, but they won't. They have stopped updating that. So they stopped updating that two years ago. So XP and Vista both went out of service a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How? What's the most recent time you were able to use it? Oh, a few years ago. Yeah. 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 I don't think there's anything you can do to be honest. Uh, if you if you knew somebody or you, you you could find somebody who's sophisticated, you could say, hey, could, could you put a new new operating system on here? And they might be able to find one that would work on it uh, that would allow you to get online. That's kind of what you need is, I guess, what I'm saying. But because you can't even get online, you can't even download a new one to put on there. So you're going to need some help from somebody. Or a trip down to <laughs> Sam's Club and get yourself a Chromebook. I'll do that. Okay. I think that's the safest and best bet, Anne. I hate to spend money. Because these are, you know, they don't wear out. They're okay. They'd go on forever if if there were just software that would run on it. Yeah. I'm sorry, Anne. That's okay. I appreciate your expertise. Yeah. Reuse, recycle, right? You want to. I don't blame you. This is shouldn't go in the landfill. And, in fact, if you're worried about that, you might find there are lots of charities that will take old computers and... Uh, try to, you know, some some geek there might be able to turn it into something useful. It's probably not a lot it can do at this point. It's kind of <laughs> kind of old. I, I, you know, they you know they say dog years seven dog years per human year. So a ten year old dog is is the equivalent of a seventy year old human. I think uh, computer years are more like ten to fifteen years. So your computer. He, at best, is 130 years old, <laughs> and uh, it may be more like 200 years old. Actually, <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's done. It's done. It's time to retire. Retire. I'm sorry to say that. That's it for the tech guy for this weekend. Have a great week, a safe week, and I will see you next time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.